Good afternoon, audible? Yes, audible. Okay, good. Uh, welcome everybody, good afternoon. Uh, so let's first welcome all of you uh, to this special session of talks on Nobel Prizes and Abel Prize in Mathematics. We have series of talks lined up today. Uh, I would also like to thank all the speakers who have kindly agreed to speak about uh, uh, the Nobel Prizes and Abel Prize in the year that was that were awarded in the year 2020. So without further delay, I would first like to invite the first speaker of the session, Dr. Rajesh Ramachandran, who will be talking on the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the year 2020. So, Rajesh? Yes. The slides uh, are displayed. Yes. OK. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I thank uh, Dean Arandi, Dr. Kaushik, and also head of the Department of Chemistry, Dr. Sanjay, for giving me this opportunity to present uh, this year's uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas system. Okay, and uh, this is from the uh, Nobel website, uh, Royal Swedish Academy, where they say in their notification that on 7th October that says uh, that this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to Emmanuel uh, Charpentier and also Jennifer Doudna. Uh, Emmanuel Carpentier works at uh, Max Planck Unit of uh, Science of Pathogens in Berlin, Germany, whereas uh, Jennifer Doudna works uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. And their discovery title goes uh, for the development of a method for the genome editing. Uh, this is from the uh, Nobel website. The first picture is uh, Emmanuel Carpentier and uh, the second picture is uh, Jennifer Doudna. And let us uh, quickly go into uh, what is uh, gene or genome editing. And I guess all of us know that every organism starting from uh, human uh, to virus or virus to human, they all have got a genetic code, okay? And whether it is uh, DNA or RNA doesn't matter. They always have a, a genetic code, uh, which is basically a blueprint of the entire organism itself, which you need to get expressed at different time points during the lifespan of this organism in order to have a proper uh, functioning. But scientists are very much interested in changing this uh, genome for various purposes. And examples of editing includes a disruption of certain portion of the gene or insertion of some novel uh, you know, uh, DNA sequences and a replacement with uh, you know, an existing portion is removed and uh, something else is put in. So these can be some of the basic editing approach we do and which also have a lot of implication in the control of gene expression and also it will help in creating mutations or polymorphism and also help us uh, introducing uh, certain reporter fusions. And this lower picture cartoon basically uh, narrates the, what are the possible areas of genome editing that has got implication in uh, research in biology. Okay. And I will not go into the details, but uh, I just wanted to show this slide just to show that it is quite diverse and in depth. And this is the epic paper from uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, where uh, they uh, published uh, their finding in uh, science in 2012. And the title says a programmable dual RNA guided 
DNA endonuclease in adaptive bacterial immunity. It's a lot of words, but basically we can understand the title itself says they have made use of some uh, structural and functional components from the bacterial system. And that is something interesting. So let us uh, look into what is this bacterial adaptive immunity and uh, that will kind of give us the answer. What is CRISPR-Cas? And the word CRISPR is a palindrome for clustered, regularly interspersed, short palindromic repeats. Okay, it's a lot of uh, uh, words. And basically it indicates that a specific stretch of DNA sequence. We all know that DNA is made of four uh, bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. We normally write it as A, G, C, and T. And certain stretch of sequence are repeated. And not only that, it is palindrome as well. Maybe I'll put it in display mode. It will explain much better. And so this is basically the palindrome uh, sequence. Uh, uh, normally palindrome indicates that it can have certain bases that can form a loop. Okay, so this is the uniqueness of the CRISPR sequence. And CRISPR sequences are associated with uh, certain proteins also called CRISPR associated proteins called Cas proteins. Now let us see the top left, uh, this picture. And this uh, ash color box is a bacterial cell and the green uh, attachment on the top is a bacteriophage or a virus that attacks the bacteria. And whenever a virus attacks the bacteria, it injects its genome and then it will make use of the bacterial resources for its own survival and finally cause the death of the bacteria, it means it will kill the bacteria by lysis. So it is believed roughly around one bacteria out of 10 million got infected survives. And how this is possible? Because the injected bacteriophage DNA will be chopped by small pieces and a small portion will be retained into the genome of the bacteria. Remember the bacteriophage DNA is a small portion and that small portion is roughly around 23 to 25 bases long. Very small portion will be injected, inserted into specific region in the genome. And that is usually called as a CRISPR array. And remember, if you see this picture, you can see a green color, then blue, then a purple color, then light blue, then different colors are there. So these different colors are nothing but uh, sequences from different bacteriophages. So whenever a bacteria attacks, it has the ability, uh, whenever a bacteriophage attacks a bacteria, it has the ability to retain a short sequence. And this uh, black, uh, boxes, diamond shaped boxes are the repeat region, which do not change. They are identical in sequence and that can have a potential to form a loop. And that's what we are talking about the palindrome sequence. Like you can see here, once this region is expressed, it can give rise to this small portion of a uh, uh, stretch of pre CR RNA. CR RNA basically means CRISPR uh, RNA. And that will be further processed into tiny pieces. Remember this black area can form a loop, whereas this uh, green, blue, purple color sequences are viral specific, okay? And then there are a bunch of Cas proteins also, and they are different in function. Some of the Cas proteins allow the excision of the bacteriophage DNA and integrate into the bacterial genome. And some of the Cas proteins are helpful in identifying the target of the bacteriophage genome. I mean, we'll see more in detail about that. And uh, this is uh, what you are seeing palindrome means, which can have a potential to form at the loop. And the loop structure is very important. And we'll see in a short while why it is important. So like, uh, there was an article that is published uh, in uh, science, which basically says the CRISPR craze. And we will wonder why there is a craze about that. Because the discovery of uh, CRISPR and Cas9 system, it allows us to program and perform gene editing in vivo in mammalian cells. And that is the huge advantage. We'll see uh, how this is uh, possible in a short while. A small RNA sequence can change easily the target to a different site of the same genome. That is something very uh, wonderful. 
and it is a simpler and easier approach than other popularly used approaches such as zinc finger nucleus shortly written as zfn and also talent which is also a similar uh, repeat based approach but it is much more complex to implement because of the off target effect ZM zfn use also suffers from off target effect off target effect means you wanted to edit a x region but it will not only edit the x region but it can influence the y region also in the genome which you don't want and the most important part of uh, crispr cas system is unprecedented efficiency and stunning ease of use and most importantly what happens is the gene therapy which is once thought to be a dead topic is uh, got revived back into action and this is a timeline of expression i will not go into the details the upper half normally is the evolution of the crispr biology whereas the lower half is the genome editing and by around 2012 you can see these two areas merged together and from 2013 onwards you can see an explosion of research publications and uh, if it if i am not exaggerating whatever you would imagine that has to be done to a genome that is possible with crispr cas system and how this crispr cas system works like we have seen in a in a brief way first let us see this uh, uh, panel a which is the genomic crispr locus as you can see here the red color a small area is there which is called tracer rna what tracer rna indicates transactivating crispr rna it is a, a non coding rna in the bacteria and then you have got a cas9 protein and then you have got cas1 cas2 and csn and csn2 which is also another cas protein so this cas1 cas2 and csn which basically helps the bacteria to excise a small portion from the bacteriophage and insert into this genome to crop to cause a crispr repeat spacer array and that will keep in the uh, bacterial genome forever and whenever this bacteriophage attacks ever because it has got a small portion from this genome it, this area will get transcribed and that portion which has got like the multicolored portions are multicolor like i already told you that is originated from different bacteriophage that can go and bind to a bacteriophage genome so what we have to see here is this tracer rna and the cr rna so what you see here is the cr rna after maturation and along with the action of the tracer rna can assemble in a particular locus like what you are seeing here this free cr rna is bound with tracer rna and also the cas9 protein so once these three are assembled that will invite a rna three that will chop this uh, rna like you can see here this loop portion will be lost in the next stage so what it does is it will create a cr rna and a trimmed tracer rna and the cas9 complex which is ready for action it will go and act on to the bacteriophage genome whenever it encounters a infection and it can uh, this cas9 is basically a, a endonuclease it can act on to a specific sequence called pam sequence pam sequence is a abbreviation of photo proto spacer adjacent motif which is basically a um, uh, ngg basically sequence n can be enucleated and then to gg and we will see that uh, more in detail so if you see uh, this is another version of what we have already seen so this is the genomic dna of uh, the bacteriophage and this is the cr rna what you see in green color and this is the tracer rna what you see in blue in color and the complex is the cas9 and this is the pam sequence where the actual endonuclease action takes place like you can see here tgg acc so this is one of the uh, well known uh, pam sequence now question is the work of uh carpentier and dodna was to get rid of this multi rna protein system into a two component system what is that two component system they fused this cr rna and tracer rna to form a single rna called grna and they also gotten rid of the requirement for this exonuclease 3 to trim it so they already delivered a already trimmed portion so that it can interact with the cas9 whereas the requirement for the pam sequence like ngg or ncc is not uh, bypassed everything happens as usual and 
this discovery of uh, this crispr cas system was done by um, emmanuel carpentier because she is basically a microbiologist biochemist and uh, geneticist and she used a human pathogen that is streptococcus pyogenes and she discovered that uh, it has got uh, a much a simpler system that it has got a tracer rna it has got a cr rna and it has got a cas9 system whereas different bacteria can have more num more than one cas9 proteins also but uh, streptococcus pyogenes was much simpler in that manner like you can see here in this picture this is a loop where uh, the dna gets opened up and it is bound by this unique sequence which is derived from the bacteriophage which is retained in the bacterial genome when there is a second time attack it can pair it's like normally dna pairs to its target by complementation like adenine pairs with uh, uh, thymine guanine pairs with cytosine and this is the cr rna then you have got uh, the tracer rna and then you have got the cas9 so this is the main discovery of uh, uh, emmanuel uh, carpentier and this is put with a linker loop and that is the collaboration of uh, jennifer dodna at the university of california berkeley uh, allowed them uh, to create because uh, she is a jennifer dodna is a biochemist and rna biologist so because it is not just adding a loop you have to retain the secondary structure because many of this rna binding enzymes have got a, a strong affinity to its target not based on the sequence of the rna but based on the secondary structure of the rna so when you are putting a loop it is not just fusing to rna but you have to also retain the uh, uh, secondary structure and that is exactly what is done in this evolution like you can see here in the first one it is a multi component system you have got cr rna you have got tracer rna and you have got the cas9 and you simply fuse with a linker loop you have got a much easier uh, and uh, like you can see here this is the grna now cr rna and the tracer rna are called as sg rna means single guide rna and they fused it and the performance remains the same pam sequence it attacks and uh, it can cleave the target dna and this is exactly what the nobel prize was gone for they made the system much simpler into a two component system there is only one sg rna and then there is only a cas9 and this is the area what you are seeing here is the area where you can modify any sequence of your inter interest and you can make uh, any gene any organism genome targetable and the cas9 can come into picture and it can attack that area and cause a damage and now let us see why it is so important because once there is a damage the system undergoes a repair mechanism that is two different repair mechanisms are there one is nhej non homologous end joining and another is hr that is called homologous recombination non homologous end joining is a blindfold way of functioning that means if there is a dna damage the system's enzyme or that organism or the cells enzymes randomly try to fill the gap with some sequence some random sequence this invariably creates mutation so if you wanted to disrupt a gene one gene you wanted to get rid of it you simply can follow a nhej means you just need to put a crispr cas9 target and do nothing because the system will repair itself and during this process it will cause various uh, insertions and deletions and net result is gene is mutated and whereas the second option you can repair the system with anything of your interest that means you imagine a situation you moved into a house and uh, you didn't like the house wall painting you scrape it and put a painting of your like uh, your liking or you change the electric bulb and put anything of your liking so this is called homologous recombination all you need is this flanking this damaged portion what you are seeing here you need to have some similarity here and this portion can be anything of your interest it can be a reporter gene it can be a novel gene anything you can put in and that is called homologous recombination and this is what you get it because of the a uh, deletion like this is the wild type dna and this is the pam sequence you are seeing here and this green color is the targeted region and because of the crispr cas9 action you end up getting see here you are ending getting 16 bases extra than what is uh, already present in the wild type dna here is 11 and then sometimes you lose the actual sequence so net result all these clones 
one, two, three, four, five, six of them I mentioned, all of them are a loss of function. Uh, many, many, many a case, it will be a loss of function of this genome. And whereas when you want to repair it with a recombination, like I have given an example of this so-called sickle cell anemia, and it's a point mutation, the glutamic acid gets replaced by valine that causes sickle cell anemia. Say if this mutation is there, GAG, and uh, GTG, this is the wild type, and this is the uh, mutation. So what you can do is, if this mutation is there, you can cause a damage because if you have got a PAM sequence, PAM sequence is pretty frequent, like every 32 bases will have a PAM sequence. So it's not something rare. And you cause a damage and then replace it with a wild type copy, exactly like this. And end of the day, you get a homologous recombination. You end up getting an edited DNA. And a lot of cell types and organisms have been used. I will not go into the details. You name it, almost every organism, the CRISPR-Cas system works, although it is originated from the bacteria. It works in every known uh, plants and animals and uh, cell types. And the application uh, includes, uh, like I will not go into the detail, it can be used for gene therapy to improve the crop plants and also you know, uh, design novel drug target. It has implication in synthetic biology and pathway engineering and also a lot of ecological vector control, targeting the mosquito to cause it sterile, et cetera. And a uh, lot of, like these days, like uh, I talked about the uh, pyrococcus, um, there is another bacteria called pyrococcus furiosus, which can, which has a CRISPR-Cas system that can target the RNA. So that has got huge implication in this, you know, uh, this novel coronavirus, et cetera, which is an RNA virus. So uh, not that it need to be a DNA virus, any foreign RNA can also be targeted. But controversies on uh, patent war also need to be mentioned regarding this because uh, recently Chinese scientist, uh, He Jiangqi, uh, he made a genome edited human babies, uh, which uh, apparently has uh, some uh, resistance to HIV infection. So this just raised a lot of controversy, although it seems beneficial, but uh, humans are trying to play, take the role of uh, you know, nature, et cetera. And the controversy uh, uh, has kicked up from that with the loss and other things are going to come uh, to use of CRISPR system, just like embryonic stem cell controversies. And uh, other uh, one more patent war uh, uh, that occurs between uh, the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, uh, who first demonstrated, like Feng Zhang of Broad Institute demonstrated that you can use CRISPR-Cas system to edit human cells. Whereas Jennifer Doudna, uh, Emmanuel Carpentier did not show in living cells, they rather showed in mitro system and hence the current use, uh, the patent for use in human cells lies with Broad Institute, not with the discoverers uh, because they never showed in uh, took a claim. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so Very much, much. Uh, Rajesh for a wonderful yeah, talk. Uh, we have uh, time for a couple of quick questions. So, yeah, I think there is a question from one of the participants uh, in the Zoom link. The question is, in a natural context, when bacteriophage attacks the bacterium, how does the bacterial cell ensure that the DSB disruptions in the viral genome is not repaired back by the bacteria's own DSB repair system? Uh, see, when uh, even if a repair happens, usually, it, unless there is a recombination with a normal copy, it will not restore back the normalcy. Because whenever there is a repair happens randomly, like I told you, it is, will be uh, non homologous end joining, a random filling. Uh, so that cannot. And another thing is uh, bacteriophage can have multiple location, like bacteriophage genome can be inserted in multiple location, not that it should be present in one CRISPR array. So technically mul uh, viral genome are much smaller, like a bacteriophage will have around 40 KB, 30 to 40 KB. KB means 40,000 bases. And that if you make into pieces, assembling them back will not be that easy because it will randomly get into pieces. But however, that repair happens efficiently, then the phage will retain normalcy. Okay. Uh, Vijay, is there any question from YouTube participants? No questions, actually. No questions. Okay. Okay. Then if there is no other question, uh, I would like to thank Rajesh again okay. for delivering the talk on Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the year 2020. Thank you so much. So now... Uh,
with this, we'd like to invite the next speaker of the session. That would be Dr. Kinjalap Lochan. And he will be talking about the Nobel Prize in Physics for the year 2020. So, Dr. Kinjalap. Uh, yeah. So, uh, am I audible? Maybe a little louder. Uh, is that fine? Is that fine now? is clear now yes it is clear now yeah okay uh, thank you Koshik, for inviting me and thank you Rajesh, for a wonderful talk um, so i'm going to talk about the nobel prize of 2020 and let me try to share my screen and please let me know if it is visible yes visible part. okay so Fine. So I'm going to discuss about the Nobel Prize in Physics of uh, year 2020, and which was awarded to these three scientists, uh, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, Professor Reinhard Genzel, and Professor Ambria Gies. And uh, this award this year goes to in the research in the field of gravity, astrophysics, and so on. This is a consecutive year in which the award area in physics has been around astrophysics and gravity. So let me get going. So uh, Professor Roger Penrose is an emeritus professor at the University of Oxford right now. And he is uh, born in 31. And he did his PhD from Cambridge in year 58 with, with Professor John Todd. Uh, professor Reynard Genzel is the co-director of Max Planck Institute of Extraterrestrial Physics. And he did his PhD in 78 with Professor Peter Miser and uh, Professor Andia Gaze is also a professor at Department of Physics and Astronomy in UCLA. And uh, she did his, her PhD in 1993 uh, in, from UCLA itself under Professor uh, Neugeber. So the award uh, of 2020 has been divided into two parts. One half goes to uh, Sir Roger Penrose for the discovery uh, that a black hole formation is a robust prediction of general relativity that we will come to. What does it exactly mean? Now, one fourth each has gone to two of the other Nobel laureates, Reynard Genzel and Andrea Gates, for observational discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Okay, so I will briefly touch upon the works which has led to the Nobel Prizes for them in a small section. Since it's only a 30 minute talk, I will be uh, not very technical. I will try to uh, put through the broad idea of the discussion. If you have any question query, you can ask me after the talk. And still, if you want some technical details on that, uh, you can contact me on my email address, kinjal.isanmohali.ac.in. OK? So let's start about the first part, the uh, work of uh, Dr. the Professor Roger Penrose. So that this works essentially deals about the prediction of that general relativity allows for, or rather prefers, black hole solutions in its structure. So by now, many of you are maybe familiar with the black hole structure or might at least have heard about the term. So the story of black hole is not really the story of uh, general relativity alone. Even in Newtonian mechanics, the genesis or the primal seeds of something like a strange object like a black hole was envisaged. Uh, this came from of two of the observations one had in Newtonian gravity, which was to deal with the how to deal with the gravitational effect of a massive object, which is acting upon light, light being made of photons, which are massless. How do Newtonian gravity predicts what will happen to light when it interacts gravitationally with a massive object? The first statement from Newtonian gravity, which we know about, is that a force of gravity is proportional to the mass of the gravitating object, the mass of the object on which gravity is acting, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between these two, two, two bodies. So looking at this, massless object should not feel any gravitational force. That looks like one of the prediction. But what about the acceleration generated by this? So acceleration generated by this gravitational force is also divided by the mass. So mass of the photon cancels out from these two equations and the acceleration is gm upon r square. So it looks like the Newtonian gravity also predicts while there may not be any force to act upon because of the zero mass, 
acceleration might be non zero because it has a undetermined form of zero upon zero okay the second thing one can look upon on this is that suppose i think of a planet over here which i have trying to draw uh, there is an object which i want to throw up such that it completely escapes out from the pull of its gravity then i know i have to uh, supply it a uh, certain amount of escape velocity above which it will get out of the gravitational clutches of this planet otherwise it will go some, uh, uh, some height up and then collapse back onto the surface the escape velocity which i have to supply to the object is proportional to the square root of mass and also is uh, proportional to uh, this uh, inverse of the distance g m upon r okay so it's up to a factor of 2 probably so the question was suppose i take a massive star and then shrink its size to the radius gm upon c square so i just have to push and compress the star to a size such that its radius becomes g upon c square now once that happens what would be what would be the uh, escape velocity actually there is a factor 2 as well which i have not written so effectively you have to shrink this uh, star up to the size of 2 gm upon c square once you shrink this size of the star to radius 2 gm upon c square you will see that escape velocity approaches c speed of light that means you have to supply speed of light to any ob object which has to get out of the pull of the gravitational force of the planet what does it say it says that it's, if you further shrink the object then you can no longer throw anything out of the uh, gravitational pull of the planet not even light because light will at most move at the speed of uh, speed of light c but even that would not be sufficient because v escape will become larger if r becomes smaller than gm by c square 2 gm by c square so that looks like a, a hand waving or argument such that something drastic may happen at 2 gm upon c square which newton's gravity is silent about even newton when asked about this question would uh, uh, respond to saying that he would not like to speculate what happens when the light interacts with such a massive object let it be seen in nature whether such a thing exists or not so there was no clear answer now this answer to this kind of question was an addressable in the revised approach of gravity which goes by the name of einstein's general relativity so what einstein's gr does gr stands for general relativity it does away with gravitational force as a separate force of nature but slides slides it back into the game by saying that what we call the force of gravity is nothing but the, the specific form of curvature of a space time manifold so there is mathematical terminology being used so one has to think that all the motion all the movement of the all particles and planets are going around in a fabric of space time they are moving in space and they are also moving in time and that fabric is called space time and that fabric is a curved fabric it is not a flat fabric it it has some curvature it may have over density under density and those kind of thing that determines the curvature determines how the particles would move you might have seen this kind of diagrams many ways uh, in discussions that uh, space time fabric is given by the sheet this uh, rubber kind of sheet you can see in the on bottom left and when you put a mass around this there is a dent created in this fabric which is called the curvature i personally would like to uh, convey a picture apart uh, from this sheet you can think of a, a cubical object okay it should be hypercube actually in four dimension but let us for simplicity you can think of three dimensional cube such that all the elements of this cube are made by some magnetic material think of chains making a cube out of this and inside that there are smaller cubes and so on and so forth so all these blue chains are time like chains that means if you start at any point on this cube and move along the blue lines you will be moving in time while if you move along the red lines you will be moving in space now the statement of general relativity is that if there is no mass and no energy and nothing then the cube remains a perfect cube that you move orthogonally along the time direction and so along the space direction in the red direction as well as soon as you bring a material mass or energy or pressure or anything which carries some energy or momentum what happens that it is equivalent to putting a magnetic object at the center of the cube which pulls all the magnetic connecting chains towards itself so the cube gets deformed so the lines which are connecting various surfaces they also get deformed and then 
even when you are moving along time you are not moving on a straight line even if you are freely moving along the space you are not moving on a space a straight line you are moving on the red dotted lines or blue dotted lines which are now deformed the equivalent picture of that which gets uh, circulated most of the time in discussion is the bottom last picture which is the dent is created in the space time fabric this fabric is really not a two dimensional fabric but a four dimensional fabric and therefore a good generalization of that you can think about as the 3d cube i have uh, tried to pictureize here okay fine so now since the statement of general relativity is that there is no separate force only dent is created in the space time fabric and particles move as they wish on this fabric only that they feel that the dent has been created so if that is true for any particle that will be true for light as well how, let us see how so suppose there is no mass put anywhere no deformation has come to the fabric the cube has remained as the perfect cube then what will happen suppose i start with some point suppose you take the leftmost diagonal point of the uh, this sheet then suppose one direction suppose the y axis is the c times t direction this is the length scale called ct x axis is just some distance scale x so it, this is the diagram in ct and x now suppose the particle is moving with the speed of light its equation of motion will be x is equal to ct x is equal to ct in this diagram will make a 45 degree line which i had depicted by this green green lines okay so all the green lines are traveling null rays or traveling light rays in a space time which has not not been deformed and it's uh, is free of any mass energy or anything now what what happens if a, a massive object or any energy is brought in then as we learned that this einstein theory predicts that the surface will be deformed a dent will be created now you look at the green lines they will also get slightly deformed because they have to keep try to align themselves along the 45 degree line locally so they will get deformed also in their motion so all those particles which are moving with speed less than the speed of light will be making an angle larger than 45 degree and they will be moving on different trajectories as well but all of them will get slight amount of deformation because of the dent created in the space time fabric and so would be the trajectory of the light affected now an interesting question would occur that how long this deformation will keep happening meaning suppose i am making i keep making the dent uh, deeper and deeper what will happen so let us start with the leftmost trajectory over here that what it will do is that suppose you are far away from the dent the deformation brought into the trajectory of light will be marginal it will not be deviating much from its anticipated straight line trajectory but as soon as you start going towards your towards the dent created in the fabric it will start getting deformed more and more in particular if you are very close to the trajectory the bending will be very large and there may come a situation in which the dent is so deep or curvature is so large that the light trajectory is completely bent backwards and it comes back to you so once you throw the light towards it so if you are sufficiently close to the high curvature regime the light may get rebounded back to you and it will not go on the classically anticipated straight line so this is the phenomena of called uh, now understood as strong gravitational lensing all other things which we are talking about the first two lines are weak gravitational lensing now we have a good evidence of this things happening in nature actually this was one of the test eddington did in 1999 to say see that in in the uh, presence of sun the distant stars positions look slightly distorted they do not appear on the same places which they they would have appeared if sun was not there appearance of sun on a, a solar eclipse day you would find that the all the stars in the background of sun look slightly distorted because they are moving around the sun with small distortion brought about by the sun's gravitational dent this is was uh, uh, two years back we celebrated the centenary year of the eddington's uh, observation but now we have good evidence evidence for this gravitational lensing happening both a uh, weak field limit and strong field limit if you have a very massive star the dent would be very large and the bending known to the light would be large as well so how to calculate how much amount of dent has been there so this answer fortunately was readily available just after the theory of general relativity arrived just after one month of einstein's celebrated paper on general relativity a scientist called swaschel put down exact solution of those equations which goes by the name of swaschel solution which gave the curvature generated in this space time fabric 
in terms of the derivative of certain function which i have written over here g mu nu are those functions whose derivative and inverses and various combination give rise to curvature of the fabric i'm not going into the mathematical detail but if one is interested one would learn that from this g mu nu and its derivative a uh, mathematically robust curvature structure or observable of curvature can be uh, constructed which is an invariant quantity curvature invariant quantity which in this solution since you, since you see the matrix g mu nu has four non zero elements in the diagonal 1 minus rs upon r the inverse of 1 minus rs upon r r square and r square sin square theta okay now rs itself is two gravitational constant g multiplied with the mass which is the mass of the blue planet or star i have put upon c square now due to this the function g mu nu the curvature which is generated in the space time fabric is proportional to mass square and inversely proportional to r to the power 6 it is also inversely proportional to c to the power 4 and directly proportional to g square but those are fundamental constants in a realistic settings uh, what we could change we could look on different massive stars that would change m and we can go close or far from the star and that would change r so you see if you go away from the star the point where star is putting the curvature will fall very rapidly because it goes as 1 over r6 so sufficiently far away from the star you will not feel any curvature effect and the life would be as simple as the flat space uh, gravity which is equivalent to newtonian gravity in many respects but as soon as you start going close to this curvature uh, uh, curvature effects will start uh, affecting you so that is what the statement of paul sochil was there now in this solution has a uh, few some curious landmarks so if you solve for the trajectory of massive particles in this you will realize that 6 gm upon c square is the location of a last stable circular orbit that means if you have to put a particle on a circular trajectory you can do it as long as your radius of the circle is greater than 6 times the mass of the uh, star and upon c square multiplied with g so 6 gm upon c square is the last circular stable orbit for uh, a massive particle now 2 gm upon c square is also a very curious place which is because it is a light boundary that means at r is equal to 2 gm upon c square the if you see the metric the one of the component of the metric becomes zero the other becomes infinity so that is a, a curious point if we look at the angle subtended by uh, the light cone over there one would realize that the light cone actually coincides with 2 gm by c square that means the light starts moving along the r is equal to 2 gm upon c square point so it's a light boundary r is equal to 2 gm is not a radial coordinate anymore it becomes a light null coordinate in some sense at r is equal to 2 gm upon c square now life inside 2 gm upon c square is further weird because you see the signatures of this first two diagonal elements get flipped previously when as long as r was greater than 2 gm by c square the zero zero the topmost uh, diagonal element of metric was negative while the first uh, diagonal element the g11 let us say was uh, positive uh, is there a question i can see there is some question in chat uh, i will try to to take up questions at the end only because i have only limited amount of time so kindly wait uh, till the end uh, i will try to be fast and we can have some time for question answer okay so uh, so our life inside r is equal to 2 gm upon c square is also very uh, weird because the space and time flip their signature and whatever we used to be familiar with as a space becomes time and vice versa now these are all fascinating interesting uh, things about social solution but more particularly or worrisome point is r is equal to 0 where you calculate the curvature invariant it will blow up on your face the curvature becomes infinity that means dent created by the mass at r is equal to 0 is infinitely infinitely deep that is a problem that is a singularity so anything which predicts infinity in physics is problematic in the sense of the theory what which we are working with that means the general relativity theory which we are working with is predicting an infinity from the finite elements of construction we did not put any infinity by hand but still we are getting at the answer at in the curvature it is predicting that there is singularity over there what to do with that now what does the singularity tell you exactly about it tells you up to r is equal to 2 gm the light will be deformed bent back and what not but once you cross over and enter 
R is equal to 2 gm line, the light rays will go inside the 2 gm regime, 2 gm upon c square, and will march towards the infinitely deep dent created. So they will keep going towards the infinitely deep dent, and they will never recover from there. So everything which enters R is equal to 2 gm, even light, will be deposited at R is equal to 0, and they will have no chance to come back out of it. So everything which enters R is equal to 2 gm gets deposited at R is equal to 0, making the density or energy stored at R is equal to 0, one point infinitely large, and the density therefore shoots up. So the curvature, the density, everything at this point become infinitely large, and that is a problem for theory. Now, these kind of singularities were not unheard of. These things also appeared in cosmological evolution. If you take the universe which is expanding and try to collapse it back in past, you will see everything looks like it started from a point which was infinitely dense, having infinitely large curvature. Similar kind of collapse situation. So right now we were discussing about Schwarzschild solution, which was a mass put in over there, and not, no dynamics was going on. However, there will be dynamic solution, which goes by the name of Oppenheimer, Snyder, and Dutt. Uh, so the three gentlemen, actually Dutt was uh, one person from Kolkata, which who has obtained the solution much before Oppenheimer and Snyder did, but unfortunately, before it could be published, he passed away. Later on, his contribution was recognized, and it goes by the name of Oppenheimer, Snyder, and Dutt collapse, where a homogeneous cloud gets collapsed at to a point and creates a singularity for you. So these kind of similarities were fairly regular in Einstein's theory of general relativity. Probably they were trying to tell something of, about the nature of the theory. But uh, since the advent of the general relativity, many eminent scientists, including Einstein them, himself, was not very appreciative of these infinities. And most of the time, these infinities were just discarded, saying that, oh, to generate these kind of solutions or singularity, you need very special symmetry. For example, in Schwarzschild solution, we have discussed here, this was supposed to be a spherically symmetric mass moving, not moving, just put at a point. So it was static, it was spherically symmetric. So this is special symmetry we are requiring. In nature, there will never be a perfect spherical symmetric object. You will have some distortion somewhere coming from some perturbation. And Einstein and other people believe that will destroy the singularity structure which we are observing. Similarly, Big Bang universe, the universe is supposed to be homogeneous and isotropic, and then its dynamics predicts uh, infinity at past back. That was uh, questioned by saying that, okay, again, you have uh, some special symmetries, very sophisticated symmetries you are putting in him by hand. And similarly for Oppenheimer collapse as well, that the dust cloud is supposed to be homogeneous as well, so which is collapsing. So all this symmetry, homogeneity, spherical symmetry, and isotropy, those are appro approximate structure of the universe, not a total reality. So therefore these symmetries, if, if they are not there, people hope that these singularities which you are seeing will not be there. It was not easy to check with this because Einstein's theory, which is Einstein's field equation of gravity, is actually a nonlinear equation and with very few exact solutions. Solving exactly for arbitrary mass distribution is really out of the game as far as our skills of solving differential equation is concerned. So therefore, one can only envision or guess what would happen. So majority of people around 1950s or so, between 1950 and 60, were not very appreciative of the idea that there will be a singularity in the theory which comes about, and they said that special symmetries are required, nothing really, no, no singularity really will appear in realistic settings. Okay, so then around 1960 and afterwards, a new set of uh, scientists came up with less amount of prejudice about these singularities. They tried to analyze these singularities more detail, and one particular contribution came from India, from uh, Professor Amal Rai Chaudhary, who wrote down a kinematical equation for evolution of curvature or the ge geodesic movement. That, that goes by the name of Rai Chaudhary equation in 1963. The question what he asked is not about Einstein theory of general relativity or anything. He just asked the question, how would set of particles move in a curved background? So suppose you have a surface, which I have tried to draw here, and there are some dots which are particles and they move in some direction. Okay, and they are freely moving, so they can move in this uh, this strings which you are seeing is the trajectories along. Now, how do they move? Will depend on on the local points. What is the curvature? What is the shear they are fear, uh, feeling? What is the rotationability of the surface which are? They are living upon and so on and so forth. So write down a kinematical equation just from the world, we will, whether they will maintain the same distance and so on and so forth. And that depends on these three quantities uh, dominantly. 
local curvature, shear, and vorticity. Now, in conjunction with the Rai Chaudhary equation, what one can do is to know about what happens to these geodesic by applying this local curvature effect from Einstein's general relativity. So as we learned, Einstein's theory of general relativity told us how much curvature will be generated. You put some amount of energy or mass. You can use that and try to say for normal kind of matter, if you put some energy density, what kind of curvature will be generated? Once that is known, you can find out from the other equation what will happen to the congruence of the geodesic, whether they will converge, whether they will diverge, and so on and so forth. So with this, Penrose came up with the idea of something called trapped surfaces. So what is a trapped surface? For that, I will not go into mathematical detail, but just give you a working example to see what it is. So suppose there is a space-like surface at some time, t is equal to zero. It's a snapshot of a world at some particular time. Now think of a particular radius, the red, red, red circle I'm drawing, some r is equal to constant. Now at t is equal to zero, all points on this circular radius emit light waves, which is given by the shiny, uh, orange kind of figure, at t is equal to zero, they start from there. After some time, this light wave fronts will grow and will become something larger than the red circle which I have tried to draw, which, uh, which is there on some future time surface. So that would happen in any normal surface that you start with the, the outgoing light fronts will just go grow larger and become larger than the red circular uh, points, set of points which, which emitted them. That is uh, fine. But what happens if the surface on which this red and uh, the orange particles are put in, photons and other particles are put in, that itself starts shrinking. That means the wavefronts are emitted. They are trying to move away from the red circular points. But in the meanwhile, the space on which they are doing so is also shrinking from all sides. So they, at the same time, in this case, at some other time t is equal to tf, the photon wavefronts will be away from the radius uh, from the red circular points, which now themselves have collapsed because the whole space is collapsing back. So there can be three cases: the the orange light pulse uh, wavefront that may be the size of that may be same as the size where they started with, maybe larger than the initial size and maybe smaller than the in initial size. That depends on the how fast this shrinking of the full space fabric is happening. Now, in the case where the size of the light front later on becomes smaller than the light front at the initial stage, goes, if that happens, then this surface is called a trapped surface. That means if the light front starts from this point, even in the future, they will start collapsing back because they are moving away from the point of their emitting, but the whole space is collapsing and the rate of collapse is much faster so that they are collapsing back towards this, despite they are out moving. So this is the notion of trapped surface. Now using Rai Chaudhary equation, Penrose uh, was able to prove that if you, you use just Einstein's field equation and some reasonable properties of matter, which go by the name of certain energy conditions, I will not go into detail what these are, but they are very regular energy conditions, which almost all of the matter which we know satisfy. Then one can prove that all the, if then the trapped surfaces will form and then trapped surfaces form, then it is evident that the event horizon and the singular formation and the singularity formation will necessarily happen. Now, this was some real time progress because this did not, did not assume any spatial symmetry as the, the antagonist of the previous singularity appearance were uh, pointing out that the appearance of singularity in those solutions where may have been artifact of special symmetries. Now this general theorem, what Penrose could prove was that certain energy conditions are sufficient, forget about symmetries. Then in other uh, uh, non-symmetric solutions also, you will find those singularities. No wonder Schwarzschild was harboring such a singularity because it was also satisfying those reasonable energy conditions. Very soon, another set of solution which goes by the name of Kerr solution, which was not spherically symmetric also was also found out by a New Zealand scientist, uh, Roy Kerr, and it also had a trapped surface. It also had a horizon. Similarly, in dynamical collapse of stars, which are not homogeneous, one can also show that the trapped surfaces will, will regularly form. So the formation of trapped surfaces after the dry Chaudhary equations, which are kinematical in nature, guide to you to the fact that the singularity will also be formed. 
was shown to be true and therefore the singular existence of horizon and singularity was uh, established since the symmetry required so symmetry was really not the thing symmetry was only required to solve and get the exact solution but the essence of singularity was already there once your matter and uh, matter and energy momentum tensor satisfy certain reasonable conditions later on hawking combined this idea with universe expansion uh, tried to prove and actually prove that there are singularity in the past of the universe as well which goes by the name of big bang singularity so the set of this theorem goes by the name of hawking penrose theorem one deals about the black hole collapse other deals about the big bang singularity at the early universe and now one can show in various kinds of model various kind of symmetries various kind of absence of symmetries the singularity is regularly observed so there is a robust prediction of general relativity that singularities will generally occur now it does not say that there will be black hole in the nature it tells only that the if general relativity is true black holes are very likely okay it says that in the ambit of general relativity appearance of singularity is likely now more, most of the modern time scientists believe in extreme curvature regime when curvature grows very large einstein theory of general relativity itself goes for a toss and maybe fails at high curvature regime so what do we do if a singularity is not there then what should we do about horizon how much time kaushik do i have yeah i mean uh... it's almost the time if you can wrap up within like few five minutes. minutes yeah i'll try to wrap up in 5 minutes so let us try to see if uh, what ha happens at the horizon at the horizon as we saw the curvature goes as r to the power 6 if m becomes larger horizon size becomes larger and the curvature becomes smaller therefore if we can spot a object with a horizon then it would be low a uh, object with large horizon that curvature there will be low and then the einstein general relativity is supposed to be true over there now we have to look for a object with a large horizon that means object with a large mass and that is the search of a supermassive black hole which uh, two observatories uh, the eastern southern observatory in chile and cape observatory in hawaii took on with the two prominent no uh, researcher awarded the nobel prize for that uh, renard goenzel for the eastern southern observatory eso and the cape guided by uh, andrea gaze so what did they do it was known for years that the towards the center of our uh, milky way there is a huge conglomerate of large mass so if you look deep down towards the center of the milky way it looks like the stars and the globular cluster are moving there much faster so that the mass which is pulling them should be much larger it should be in excess of millions of solar mass now but it is very difficult to see through the galaxy because there are so many stars so many dust particles over there so visible light coming from there gets blocked by this dust over there in the galaxy so what do we do one way to outsmart this dust thing is to go for the uh, different wavelength than the optical thing in optics if you see the bottom figure the thing is very dense and very uh, polluted because of dirt a uh, dust in between and the black patches you see it's just because the dust had absorbed all the light visible light and there is no emission coming out of there but if you change your wavelength to infrared you see the same region gets much clearer view and you can see towards the center of the galaxy is directly over here now what we can do is to zoom into the region of the center of the galaxy and how do we do that we should have a telescope with finer uh, resolution the larger resolution telescope will require large aperture as you have known from your 12th standard physics that the telescope with large diameter capture more photons and its resolutions becomes large as well so the idea is you take very big telescopes now the two telescopes which we talk about over here one is with the diameter of 8 meter another is the diameter of 10 meters each so these are really big telescopes the second one keck observatory is the largest optical telescope which is available right now now that is fine so we can point towards the center of our milky way which is supposed to harbor a very massive object over there because radio emissions from there suggest that the uh, mass hide, uh, hiding in uh, the the bulge of the galaxy is really large however the since we have taken care of the dust the the photons which are coming from the infrared regime or radio regime are coming unhindered towards us but there is earth atmosphere which is very vulnerable and very dynamic which blurs the image so again if we look if our resolution has separated them out the blurring by the atmosphere would further destroy so you have to do something to take care of the blurring by the atmosphere as well 
So there are two techniques, which is goes by the name of speckle interferometry and adaptive optics. Uh, I'll just talk about adaptive optics right now because this is the modern edge thing which is being used everywhere. So what do you do? So we have to take care of the blurring created by the atmosphere. So there is a, a star which is shining light and coming towards the uh, telescope, but in between there is atmosphere which is dynamic, which is turbulent, and everything is getting washed out due to that. So what do we do? So the one idea is that suppose there is a nearby star to the actual star which we are interested in, we can study that the other star first and try to see if we know everything about that star, then we can know how much effect the, the atmosphere is creating on that star and then subtract that out. That means we should have a reference star very close to the actual star we are interested in and taking out the studying the effect of the reference star about which we are totally sure and we can subtract out the atmospheric effect. Now, very rarely we will have a reference star in the vicinity of our actual star. So people adapted a different technology in which they shoot up a laser beam towards the line of sight of actual star. This laser beam goes all the way up to the uh, upper layer of the atmosphere. It is uh, sodium light, so it will go up all the way. No other, there is no much, much sodium to in the bottom layer of the atmosphere. It will go all the way up to the uppermost layer where most of the uh, sodium is deposited. They will absorb and then reflect it back. Now, when reflected back, they will come back to the telescope we are watching it from, and then we know how much distortion the atmosphere has done to this sodium emission from the upper layer. That info, this distortion information is fed onto the actual telescope, which subtracts out from its observation of actual star which we are witnessing the effect. I'm just trying to show you in a short animation how from adaptive optics off to adaptive optics on, how the image becomes much clearer if you take away the effect of the atmospheric blurriness. So you see, there were some blurry patches which you resolve, they become clear distinct marks, marks as the stars. So with that, you focus onto the center of the galaxy and there you find the stars. There we find there are many stars which are moving with different velocities. And now we know from Doppler's uh, scheme, that there is a Doppler shift from moving stars. If you see a star which emits at a different frequency, then you know what its velocity is. Once you know the velocity using the Kepler's orbital structure, you would know how much mass in which of um, how much mass of the object whose gravity is binding those stars. So I'll just play another movie over here to show you how different stars in the center of our galaxy are seemingly moving along a central point where it is marked as a cross star over here over 25 years time. Over 25 years of witnessing with this close approximate, uh, with close uh, on this zooming in into the center of the Milky Way, one could figure out that there are various stars all moving along a focus of a particular elliptical or orbit, which has a massive object at its focus, whose mass is 4 million times the solar mass, the mass of the sun, and the total mass is contained in an area smaller than the half of the solar system. I mean, between the sun and the mercury, all the mass of 4 million solar masses is put together. That much dense object can nothing else be but a black hole. So this may be a very living proof of a very massive, a very dense object at the center of our black hole. So it is not still clear it is uh, exactly a black hole because we have seen up to 200 times of the event horizon. We have not seen the event horizon directly itself we have not gone up to 2 gm upon c square distance. It 200 times the 2 gm upon c square, but still it is very dense massive object and very, very much likely to be a black hole. So that is the, uh, ad the advancement in observational astronomy and their continuous follow-up that won the Nobel Prize for these two other researchers. And with this, uh, one is trying to build better and better detector, which is one of this 30 meter telescope, which is soon, soon to come up at Hawaii again which is nine times the capacity of the plane detectors we are, which are talking about. With that, we will be able to zoom further more into the center of our galaxy and probably we'll get more direct evidence for the supermassive object, compact object we have. Okay, so thank you. I would like to thank for uh, giving me time. And I will be happy to take questions if there are. Okay, thank you, Kinjal. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll have time for very quick short question if there is any i think rest of the things kinjal has already answered uh, there was some question questions. from youtube no questions in the youtube yeah. 
maybe there were some questions in the chat box I... in the chat box actually there was a question yeah so the question is in case of that imagine cube as a space time fabric if we go on making the dent deeper and deeper then is it possible that all dents from six faces of cube merge together and if not then what will happen yeah so the cube is just a representative element of thing you can you have to think about a x so there are one cube i am talking about but this extension of the axis goes on forever so yes indeed all the six faces will go on to shrink onto a point but other points which were far beyond they will come to the replace the points which we started yeah. so the question is in case of that imagine cube as a space time fabric if we go on making the dent deeper and deeper then is it possible that all dents from six faces of cube merge together i i think i have answered this yes in principle it is possible it is but it is not that this six points demarcate the boundary of space time it is just a representative of a section of space time there are other things which are outside which will come to fill up this space okay the another question is uh, somebody asking about the formula uh, in the case of event horizon is r equals to 2 gm by c square. square the radius of the event horizon yes this is the radius of the event horizon where as we discussed the metric component one of the component becomes zero other becomes infinity so uh, 2 gm upon c square yes okay and ashish is asking whether uh, what is the null geodesic null geodesic is the trajectory a photon takes a massless particle takes okay uh, i mean for the sake of time i'll request others to ask questions maybe by email to kinjal so he is available in the campus so kinjal will be happy to answer questions over email also right sure, sure sure okay thank you james so you can send email to kinjal okay so thanks again kinjal now we would like to invite our next speaker dr sharvan sherawat and he will be talking about the nobel prize in the area of physiology and medicine sharvan yeah okay so am i audible yes all right and slides visible yes okay all right uh, so uh, all right thank you kaushik uh, for the opportunity and uh, in addition to kaushik so i i would also like to thank samajit uh, who wanted me to talk about nobel prize in physiology and medicine uh, this uh, last year basically 2020 um the nobel prize uh, in physiology or medicine uh, in 2020 were uh, given to these uh, three scientists one of them actually is a physician one of them uh, is a virologist and one of them is a molecular biologist uh harvey uh, is a physician uh, michael a virologist and charlie rice uh, a molecular biologist okay and this is their current affiliation so harvey is currently working at nih in bethesda and he is a senior investigator there uh overseeing the activities of a, a, a clinical centers in the department of transfusion um michael horton so so the work that he did uh, it was done in a in a corporate sector in chiron corporation uh, in california amriville uh, currently he is running a program in virology at the university of alberta at mountain in canada uh, and charlie rice did this nobel prize work uh, where he generated this replicon of uh, hcv uh, in university of washington uh, st louis uh, the, in 2001 he moved to rockefeller where he is currently working uh, and uh, working actually in the same area hepatitis c virus the nobel prize went to uh, these three investigators for the discovery of hepatitis c virus so now in next slide it will be clear so why actually this is so important so if you look at the worldwide map uh, 
in terms of uh, the number of cases uh, for hepatitis C virus globally. So you have almost uh, 70 million cases and they are actually scattered everywhere. Okay, um, and in millions. So what uh, is hepatitis? So basically, uh, as I said, so over 70 million cases and on an annual basis, so we have about 400,000 uh, death. Uh, the transmission of hepatitis C virus is through uh, blood transfusion predominantly. Uh, it can also uh, spread through sexual uh, contacts and to some extent through vertical transmission from mother to fetus or to babies. And also uh, there are some reports where actually uh, there are nosocomial transmissions. So what that means is uh, hospital acquired transmissions. The virus looks like this. Uh, so it has this envelope. Uh, and in this envelope, so you have this uh, uh, projecting envelope protein, E1 and E2. And these proteins actually are covalently associated and they serve actually as the uh, molecule which interact with host cell receptor uh, like CD81, claudulin, uh, and many more. Uh, and they actually facilitate the infectivity uh, in susceptible cells. So beneath this, uh, you have this capsid-like structure, which actually covers the uh, nucleic uh, acid, the, the genetic material of this virus, which is actually a positive sense, single-stranded RNA, very similar to what you have for uh, the currently uh, uh, circulating coronavirus, which is causing this pandemic. Okay, so, uh, so if you talk about the genetic uh, genome organization of uh, hepatitis C virus, this is about uh, 10 kilo base uh, pair uh, size. So it has this five prime untranslated region and three prime untranslated region. Very critical sequences in five prime NTR uh, are responsible for uh, uh, the, the translation to happen. So because this has this iris site, internal ribosomal entry site. Uh, then you have almost 3000 um, uh, amino acid, long polyprotein, or rather one ORF, single ORF. Uh, and then at uh, three prime, uh, you have again the SN translated region. So as I said, so there is one ORF, which is actually uh, uh, giving rise to one poly, uh, precursor polyprotein. And this polyprotein is then processed into structural and non-structural proteins. Uh, and many of these proteins are actually shown here. Each one of these proteins actually has a distinct role. Uh, many of these are actually uh, encoding for RNA helicases, many other core factors, RNA polymerases, many of the, uh, these proteins actually also hijack your uh, defense mechanisms like interfering with the interferon signaling. All right, so uh, the hepatite, so it has uh, actually various, uh, as I said, various uh, proteins, uh, the core, and each one of those actually have distinct role in inducing proliferation of cells, inhibiting apoptosis, uh, regulation of uh, lipid metabolism, production of ROS, uh, reactive oxygen species, which actually also leads to um, chronic inflammation, uh, which leads to infiltration of uh, these lymphocytes and liver, uh, which actually is responsible for causing chronic uh, inflammatory lesion. Then many proteins of this virus actually are uh, also induce expression of these molecules like uh, TGI beta, nano twist, and these factors actually are responsible for EMT transition. This is also called epithelial mesenchymal uh, transition. And this is required for, uh, for converting a normal cell into a cancerous cell. Then you also have the production of uh, VEGF, which is also a hallmark for many of these viruses which cause cancer. Okay, if you talk about uh, what happened to uh, liver uh, when you get infected with HCV? So this is a normal liver. So after infection, so basically it goes through uh, different stages. So uh, you develop this uh, first acute uh, hepatitis and it leads to chronic uh, inflammatory conditions. There is a dysregulation uh, in the fat metabolism, development of this fibrosis. And when the extent of this fibrosis actually increases, so you start calling it a cirrhotic liver. Over a period of time, then you start developing this foci of uh, cancer uh, and that we call as hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. 
and it leads to progression uh, to a chronic cancer of liver. And uh, this is a very chronic uh, situation. So basically, uh, the infected patient does not uh, really know for quite some time that uh, you're running uh, HCV uh, infection uh, in the system. And the course can run uh, almost for 40 years before you get to this stage and uh, it's a point of no return. So really there is nothing can be done when uh, the liver is in this situation. Okay, so uh, if you talk about the viral hepatitis, uh, so there are many viruses which cause uh, hepatitis. Hepatitis A is one of the uh, uh, pathogens uh, that is responsible for this hepatitis, but this is the transmission route actually is uh, not predominantly through blood. For, uh, for blood origin, uh, the, uh, B and C are predominantly involved. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we also have another hepatitis virus, so that we call as hepatitis E virus. Uh, there are a lot of cases of hepatitis E virus in India, and there are a lot, lot of work that has already been done. But vaccines uh, for hepatitis C virus, E virus uh, are not available. For hepatitis B virus, we have a potent vaccine, and for hepatitis A as well. Okay, as I said, so the chronic hepatitis progression takes almost uh, 10 to 30 years. Uh, and leads to this uh, cancer development. Now, if we talk about uh, uh, a pathogen, so if it interacts with the host, so we, we try to uh, see uh, whether a pathogen actually meets out these criteria. Particularly, this is for bacterial infection. So, and I know that viruses actually are exceptions which do not meet this uh, Cox postulate. But can we start rethinking? Uh, considering uh, novel development in the field of virology. And uh, we have new methods for making this replicon, new system for culturing these viruses and so on and so forth. So uh, the postulates are basically, uh, the microorganism responsible for the disease has to be, pre uh, must be found in all the cases of that particular disease. The second is microorganism must be cultured and from the diseased individual. And if you inoculate this cultured, uh, microbe in healthy individual, it should be able to cause a disease. And from this diseased uh, case, you should be able to isolate this microorganism. Now, this is my perception. So the contribution of these three scientists actually can be categorized into these, uh, these different areas. So Alter, uh, Harvey Alter actually predominantly worked in the, to define the first Cox uh, postulate, little contribution for the second one, and some significant contribution for the uh, third one. Horton predominantly for the second and the fourth, and Charlie Rice actually for the second and third. Now, um, we will briefly talk about uh, what each one of uh, them did, uh, the salient observations uh, they made over a period of time and why actually this is important uh, that they should be given Nobel Prize. First, let's talk about the contribution of Harvey Alter. So the first paper actually he wrote was uh, in a medical journal, so Annals of Internal Medicines in 1972. Uh, as I said, so he was working uh, in a blood transfusion lab. Uh, so the aim was to screen uh, all these uh, blood samples for the presence of these infectious agents, which cause hepatitis. At that time, uh, actually, uh, when he joined this, uh, this lab, so before that he was working with Bruce uh, Bloomberg, uh, he got a Nobel Prize for discovering hepatitis B virus, a lot of these diagnostic methods and uh, uh, other contributions were made. So hepatitis B virus was well-defined. So diagnostic methods were known. When uh, Harvey started working, so uh, he screened, or uh, rather his team and uh, him screened a lot of these samples. Uh, and they were negative for uh, more or less uh, hepatitis B virus. And if they were transfused, so they still, if, even if uh, these hepatitis cases were, uh, they, almost 80% of these cases were not really defined to cause uh, hepatitis as a result of uh, any infectious agent. So hepatitis B was negative, but the cases that were developing, so they remain a mystery. And over a period of time, then he did uh, many more investigation and found out that 
there has to be any other, uh, uh, some other uh, infectious agent which is actually responsible for the cases of hepatitis. So then he wrote uh, the second paper in uh, Lancet where he uh, uh, performed a prospective analysis on 108 blood uh, recipients, which received apparently HPV negative samples. Out of, the, out of them, uh, 12 developed hepatitis. So by careful analysis, it was then finally defined that out of these uh, 12, three were still having HBB uh, positivity because the initial screening was done only with a very insensitive method. With this sensitive method of radio amino assay, so they were able to uh, eliminate these three cases. And if you remove these three cases out of this whole thing, so eight out of nine cases were still not uh, attributed to any of the known uh, microbe at that time. Okay, so almost 89% of the probable uh, of the cases were not actually uh, attributed to any of the uh, uh, viruses present at that. So they, they eliminated uh, screening by screening hepatitis, uh, this cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and many more. So still, they were not able to identify. So what could be the reason uh, for almost 80% of these cases? Okay. So uh, it was just negative observation that you cannot really identify many of these cases. Okay. Uh, apart from that, then he performed uh, some experiments where he collected this plasma from known, this is called known A, known B hepatitis, because they were not A positive, they're not, not B positive. And they were, because uh, they were, uh, these cases were resulted from post transfusion hepatitis cases. Okay. So what he did was so he collected the serum or plasma from these uh, positive uh, cases versus controlled and transferred this into five chimpanzees. And over a period of time, followed these animals for development of uh, disease, as can be measured by uh, looking at the liver function test, histology, and also collected these samples. And what uh, this paper actually uh, they wrote in 1978 uh, showed uh, that around 13 days, so all these chimpanzees, which were injected with this plasma or serum in different concentrations, they started showing elevated level of these enzymes, which are associated with the markers of uh, inflammation in liver. Okay, so this is what is shown here. And uh, the histology of the liver sections showed that this has to be caused by a, a, a virus-like agent because you have a lot of lymphocytic uh, infiltrations. Um, and uh, if you look at the ratio of nucleus to cytoplasm. So that was also distorted, which is actually a, a hallmark of for, uh, for, for an uh, organ, which is undergoing uh, this uh, EMT transition where cancer is developing. Okay, so Harvey was never able to identify what actually this infectious agent could be. Okay, but he showed that many cases of hepatitis were not attributed to any of the known uh, virus at that time. So the real work uh, then basically uh, was done by Michael Horton. What he did was, so he collected plasma from these chimpanzees which were infected with this NANBH agent, uh, which apparently will serve as the uh, viral antigens. How did he do, uh, do these experiments was? So he centrifuged the plasma samples uh, very extensively through ultra centrifugation, considering that if this is a virus-like agent, it has to be very small. Uh, and if you don't perform ultra centrifugation, probably you won't pellet it down. So you collected the nucleic acid from the pellet and created the cDNA libraries, put them into a bacteriophage expression system and express these proteins. So then he screened millions of those uh, clones against the antibodies which were actually recovered from the cases of known A, known B hepatitis. So the source of antibody was from humans and the source of anti antigen was from infected chimpanzees. Okay, 
Out of this screening, so he was able to identify one clone that he named as 5.1.1. And then uh, the sequence was analyzed and eventually he showed that this sequence is not matching with any of the uh, sequence present in chimpanzees or in humans and it has to be a novel sequence. Okay, and then he showed uh, that because he, you have the antigen now, now, if this antigen was resolved and blotted with the serum sample from the, uh, the plasma, uh, which were isolated from known and known B hepatitis cases, hepatitis B virus cases, hepatitis A virus cases. So you could clearly see that the, uh, the positive results were obtained only with known A, known B hepatitis cases. Okay. So, as of now, so he was able to uh, make, he was able to make a clone. Uh, he was able to actually make a clone, which was detectable by plasma collected from a known case of known A, known B uh, infection uh, collected from the patients which were developing hepatitis. Then what he did was, uh, to identify actually what is the nature of this infectious agent, whether uh, this is RNA, whether this is DNA, uh, whether this is single-stranded, whether this is double-stranded. So in many uh, experiments, uh, he was able to get to the point uh, that this has to be an uh, RNA virus. So where, uh, so I'm showing only two of these uh, results from these experiments. Uh, in different concentrations, he basically uh, performed a northern bloating. So the plasma was used to collect this nucleic acid. So it was basically uh, bloated onto this membrane. And then he created this uh, probe, which was a nick translated cDNA clone labeled with this uh, P35. And as the uh, uh, concentration of this uh, nucleic acid increased, so he was able to see a clear band. It was not available, it was not visible actually in these control samples. Okay. So what he showed was that the nucleic acid could be hybridized with the clone uh, that he identified from this screening. To find out whether this is uh, RNA or DNA as the uh, genetic material, so the nucleic acid was again uh, probed, but before uh, doing this western, uh, the, uh, this uh, northern blotting. So what he did was this nucleic acid from infect, infected chimpanzees was collected and it was loaded in this lane here. Then it was also treated with DNAs and still he was able to see this band uh, or this blot. Uh, and if it was treated with RNAs, so no band was vis visible. So it made, uh, it was very clear that this, the, the genetic material has to be uh, an RNA. Okay, uh, then uh, through a series of experiments, they were able to show uh, that this clone they identified uh, is novel because at that time hepatitis A and B were known, so he named it as um, hepatitis C virus. He defined the identity and defined actually the nature of this genetic material, which was eventually found to be single stranded DNA. And because the protein was available from this virus, so then uh, they were able to develop some immunodiagnostic assays. And with the availability of this diagnostic assay, so all these blood samples could be screened and the positive uh, samples then uh, could be discarded so that the people who are receiving these blood samples, they don't develop cases of hepatitis. So again, uh, as of now, they were able to get this, uh, get to the level that there is a novel agent, which is responsible for uh, causing hepatitis in many of these cases. But still, uh, even after getting the cDNA clone of this, uh, this agent, so you cannot really replicate it. Uh, and it was very difficult to isolate the live virus from the samples uh, because of the restricted host range poor replication of this agent in cell culture. Uh, and obviously there was no any, uh, there was no infectious clone. Because this is an RNA uh, virus. 
So it exists in quite a, a species. So what that means is that every single RNA, uh, 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 every single virus particle that you have is different from any other. So apparently you cannot really reach to a consensus sequence, sequence which, uh, which will be infectious. Uh, and another limiting factor was because you always get very limited amount of material to begin with. And uh, when you had limited material, so you really have to amplify it. And during amplification process, you create these mutations uh, because of uh, infidelity in the, uh, in the process. Now, I also showed uh, the genom uh, genomic organization of this hepatitis C virus. So five prime NTR, then ORF, three prime NTR. So what they did was, uh, they put the whole sequence of this DNA into this plasmid, uh, put another site here, and through uh, in vitro transcription, so all these replicons were created. Now these replicons can directly be injected with uh, to see whether these animals which were injected with these replicons were able to develop any uh, signs of hepatitis. Alternatively, uh, these replicons can be uh, transduced in these cells to, and select these cells uh, against uh, atomizing selection process. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, uh, so in next, uh, this is the last slide basically. So he created these 233 uh, cDNA clones uh, and then made this uh, replicons, but he failed to get any of these replicons infecting animals. Then all these clones were actually sequenced find out, to find out whether there are any mutation which were introduced uh, in between. Uh, and many of these mutations could be deleterious uh, so that they actually stop the infectivity of this replicon animals. Uh, then getting to uh, a consensus sequence lead to generation of these 10 different replicons. Uh, and if these 10 different replicons were injected in animals, so he was actually then able to show uh, that infected chimpanzees uh, by these uh, replicons, they were actually starting developing uh, hepatitis lesion. Uh, here he was able to uh, actually uh, see the presence of RNA by a very sensitive uh, method. This is called branch DNA. Uh, the level of liver function test increased as a result of this replicon injection in animals. One of the surprising thing was that in one uh, chimpanzee, uh, so this induction of the, all these markers were very, uh, it, it was occurring in an acute phase. And in another case, so it was occurring in a very chronic stage. So within two weeks, they were able to see all these markers in the other one, so within two weeks, nothing happened. So only after 10, 12 weeks of injection of this replicon, so these animals started showing sign of liver inflammation. And this is very similar to what you get in many human beings. Uh, as we know that in hepatitis, uh, these uh, people, they develop acute versus chronic infection. Uh, almost 80% of the people recover from acute infection. Uh, but this chronic infection actually leads to a very, uh, this uh, chronic condition of liver, uh, eventually leading to development of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So this was the contribution uh, made by these three scientists, uh, which led to uh, development of serological diagnostic assays for detection of blood samples for the presence of hepatitis C virus, and if this was possible, so you can curtail the number of new cases. The second was development of an animal model for, HS, uh, for HCV infection. And because now this replicon was available, so all the antiviral drugs could be made. Uh, and many of the antiviral uh, drugs actually are enlisted here. So they have very complicated names. Uh, essentially, uh, they were targeting uh, many of these proteases encoded by virus the polymerase inhibitors, uh, and many a time actually they are given in combination, in addition to interferon therapy, which uh, actually also very critical uh, treatment regime. 
So implication of this whole thing was that uh, their discovery actually saved millions of people from contracting HCV infection. Uh, and those who were already having HCV infection, so they were actually now uh, able to detect those cases. And because of the development of these drugs, very effective drugs, uh, many of these cases can be cured almost to the extent of 97%. Although there is no vaccine available for HCV as of now, uh, and so is the case with hepatitis E virus. But nonetheless, these drugs are available and they can actually uh, lead to uh, potent treatment option. These are some of the key references that uh, they published starting from Annal of Internal Medicine to New England Journal of Medicine to Lancet to Science. So uh, this discovery actually was recognized uh, this year, rather uh, 2020, uh, for awarding the Nobel. Okay, so with this, if there are any questions, I would like to take them. Thank you, Sharvan. Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, so I can see one question here that says the virus comes under coronavirus's family or not, since it well, has no, a uh, like structure. Well, it's 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 not a coronavirus. It's a, a flavi virus. Okay, flavi uh, family. Uh, it's positive sense single strain RNA virus, and positive sense means it can directly uh, actually translate into protein. So it doesn't have to go through uh, intervening. Okay. Is there any question from the YouTube link? No questions. Okay. Then once again, uh, thanks a lot to Sharvan for a nice presentation. So now we'll move to the next presentation, next talk by Dr. Himadri Roy. Uh, Dr. Himadri Roy, uh, first of all, I would express my sincere gratitude and thanks on behalf of Aisar Mohali for agreeing to deliver this talk on this special session. Professor Himadri Roy, uh, he is from Indira Gandhi National Open University. And in today's talk, he will be discussing about the Nobel Prize in Literature for the year 2020. Dr. Himadri Roy, please. Thank you, Professor Koshi Chattopata. <clears throat> I thank the Dean of uh, Research and Development, as well as to Professor Anush Vadlok, who got in touch with me for this presentation. This is basically a very, uh, what you say, like nothing slides to be shown because in literature, most of the time you don't prepare any PPTs. Most of the time you don't prepare any PPTs and this was all of a sudden planned and like, uh, when we talk about literature, Nobel Prize of Literature in 2020 went to Louis the Gluck. Uh, the name itself suggests that she has lots of European connections, though she was an American poet. She is an American poet and she was born in New York City, grew up in Long Island. She did her education from Sarah Lawrence College, and, but she could not complete her degree from Columbia where she left it on the midway for several reasons. Uh, we'll discuss those reasons why she left. And besides that, she is today at present an adjunct professor with uh, uh, Rosenkranz, uh, Rosenkranz, writer, uh, Rosenkranz writer in residence with uh, Yale University. And she stays in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She has a Romanian connection as well as a Jewish connection. Now, because of several uh, places connections with her, she tends to uh, create lots of fears and lots of, uh, let's say, uh, compassion for different kinds of what we call, in short form, desires and trauma. Now, she get no when she got her Nobel Prize, the, the Nobel uh, Committee basically announced the contribution that she made. I quote, for her unmistakable poetic voice that of the beauty makes individual existence universal. Basically, what uh, they are trying to say that 
one individual can create lots of uh, individuals in different parts of the world. Through her poetry, she has done that. She has published at least like uh, 15 different collections. Uh, Besides that, uh, she has two chat books as well as two uh, non-fiction uh, essays. Uh, and these are, this is not only what she does, she does lots of other things amongst uh, teaching poetry is one of her uh, basic agenda or basic uh, criteria of, of survival. That she, can, uh, why I'm using her quotation while giving an interview to the BBC. It's like criteria of survival. So why does she say that all her poems, if you read from the first uh, born, that the, the publication that she does in the first collection, first born, to the last one, which is Petful and the Virtuous Night, most of her collection talks about her own. It's uh, the poem is uh, therefore like she is called a confessional poet. And confessional poet uh, means uh, it is always not only written uh, in first person, but it also talks about psyche of the poet as well as the society in the first person. So that makes almost like she's parallel to Sylvia Plath, Emily Dickinson, and several other poets who are like very famous uh, that we are all in literature usually read about. Now, while doing that, uh, Robert Baker tries to critique her by saying that she is a confessional poet though, but at certain points she lacks sensitivity. Now, why does she say that? Why does he, Robert Baker, try to say that? Because she, Robert Baker took, takes point, uh, takes two of her poems. One was like Trillium, she, he takes, and the other one is Parable of the Swan. Both the poems, when Robert Baker tries to, to, tries to analyze, she, he finds that both the poems were lacking two things. One was like not only talking about loss, not only talking about failed relations, but also talking about idyllic imagery. Like, why do we have ideals? Why do we have ideally? Why, why do we create ourselves happiness which never exists in life? Therefore, like her sensibility of happiness also lacks in her temptations that she is making. That is the critique I'm bringing in. Now, the second critique that of uh, Louisa uh, Glick is uh, Michael Robbins. Michael Robbins is one of, a, one of his uh, article that came out in in the journal of uh, poetry, uh, poetic studies, like in that he says that she became depends mostly on the fiction of privacy, quote unquote, fiction of privacy. Now, why is fiction, uh, privacy is fictionalized? Because uh, to, according to Michael uh, Robbins, uh, he says that Averno, the collection of poem, Averno or Vita, no, Vita Nova, both the collection have a certain kind of fictionalized part which never existed. Like when we look into her life also, her elder sister died due to some accident, which died at a time when she was not even born. Now, this she has heard from her parents, from her other sources, other relatives or friends, but she has never uh, experienced that. She has never lived that experience. Therefore, like the shared experience that she gains is almost like fictionalizing the whole part which she talks in Vita Nova a certain, at certain times. She says that illness, uh, illness is one, death or loss from illness is one such thing that keeps on uh, repeating in one's life a lot. And therefore, like her, most of the poems talks about not only confessing at different parts of the period she has written. If you see from the uh, globalization to the post neoliberalization, before that, what we call the first wave, third wave of feminism when it was coming, uh, all this starting at the point of time, her poems also brought lots of things that are attempted to be like uh, to be talked about. Now, in her poem, what she does is, uh, if you see the technicalities of a poem, that it is not only lyrics compressed, but also the rhymes hardly used. And there are repetition of words, which we see in uh, Sylvia Plath or Emily Dickinson. Also that re repetition, they rely a lot on repetition. Louisa Glick is not far away from that. She also repeats. 
The other thing that she does is enchantment. I suppose the literature student who understands the literature, she under, uh, they will uh, be able to what is enjambment about it. Then the enjambment is uh, like mixing up too much of uh, lines together, which are called rejects. And this rejet brings lots of messages together. Suppose uh, I'll quote one line, for 16 years, I have sat and waited for things to get better. Now, this is a, these two are lines taken from Trillium of uh, the collection Wild Diaries. Now, when we talk about these two lines, we see that the syntax are incomplete. The, uh, at the end of the line, the syntax are in, uh, incomplete. Like for 16 years, I have sat. The syntax, uh, syntax gets incomplete over there. Now, this is also completed. The syntax also gets completed in the next line with a phrase. With a phrase, like things will get better. Things to get better. Now, these are certain things which delays the closure of the poem, delays the closure of thoughts. And that is how confessional poetry becomes very, very important for anything. Louisa Gluck is famous uh, these days, is one of the pioneers in confessional poetry. And therefore, her work has been recognized by the Nobel. Now, she has won several awards, Pulitzer Award. She was, has won Booker Award and many other awards. She was nominated for the Booker Award. She has won several other poetry awards, National Poetry Award. Now, that these awards do not matter to her. When, you, when she was interviewed, she says, uh, these awards are uh, meant for those who want recognition. For me, it is not a recognition. It is a desire, or it is a trauma that I have been desiring to be part of this whole traumatic world. I'm quoting from the BBC's interview. Now, these are the three things that uh, she keeps on repeating in her entire poetry collection or entire poetic life. The three things are trauma, desire, and nature. Now, if you look into her poetry, if you study her poetry, you will see that these three things are repeatedly being done. The metaphors that are used, the art involving self, uh, selfless is used many a time. Persona genres are used. Uh, emotional timidity is used. Now, when we talk about trauma, we not only talk about her own problem of uh, what is the her own problem that she has been having a psychological problem, which is uh, anorexia nervosa, basically anorexia. Uh, and this anorexia was very interesting in her life. The reason is because, why I'm saying interesting, because she was rebelling against her mother, mother's dictum, mother's uh, whatever words, mother's uh, orders, mother's anything. She was rebelling against her mother and she never liked her mother's presence in front of her. And once she realized it, she, at a very early age of six years, she started developing this. Uh, whatever mother used to feed her, she thinks that, oh, this will make me plump, this will make me fat, or this will make me... And she started developing the entire thing that her sister also probably died of this reason that her mother was too dominating. And therefore, she developed this uh, illness within herself. And uh, anorexia nervosa is basically a psychological problem that we all, most of the some psychologists say that. And therefore, it is not the loss of the elder sister, but also the death uh, that she's seen in her life. She has seen many deaths and she has come across uh, many failed relationships. And these failed relationships helped uh, her groom and attempt uh, at several uh, places. So her imageries of life also becomes therefore uh, ideally and happy at many places uh, because she is she says that there is a loss of innocence there is a loss of innocence whenever you try to be happy there's a loss of innocence because you try to struggle always for mortality and mortal desires and happiness is a mortal desire according to her and her poems also talk about that at many places like if you take meadowlands uh, parable of the swans you see in the parable of the swans you see that this uh, uh, mortal desire of being happy is 
there's no sense of ending there's no sense it never ends the happiness never ends if you try to be happy with say for example uh say a macbook or a iphone your happiness does not end over there then probably you want something more that's what she is trying to talk about over here uh, when she talks about trauma she says that the representations of these uh, never ending senses, senses that uh, comes into your mind of never ending factors of life or mortality leads you to loneliness lead you to loneliness and therefore most of the people will suffer certain kinds of psychological problems if, if your mortal desires or what we in material terms uh, in uh, criticism literary criticism we say material uh, uh, material consumerism uh, does not like uh, at certain points le lead you force you to lead a life of lonely loneliness or say for certain, certain loss suppose, suppose for example today you lose your phone if you lose your phone you understand what kind of psychological uh, trauma you go through psychological tortures you go through and this is where her second point uh, second reference uh, form that she uses is desire comes into now what do we desire as a human body what do, what does one a human body desire human body desire lots of things she says love she lives attention insight ability to can be true these are certain desires that most of the human being uh, wants and it happens from time to time at a early age probably love is what you want and then probably uh, after you grow up into a teenage uh, according to the freudian terms we see that when you come to the teenage attention is one such thing many children many children especially luisa gluck when she talks about gluck herself when she reveals about her own childhood days she says that attention is one and uh, seeking attention is one such desire i always had that like people should notice me and then when you grow up when when you, when you get education which she lacked but despite she feels that once you get uh, education you start uh, having insights of many other fields many other uh, places many other faces which you probably are unknown to the most of us like uh, most of the people and then the ability to convey the truth at uh, we all know that we all sit at different positions we all uh, try to be in a different position and control things or try to dominate the way we want to like she refers to a mother at this point like when she talks about in the poem seven ages she says that mothers are like that that probably uh, mothers try to pamper the child or love their child over love their child over pamper their child and then what happens that the children lack the uh, lack the uh, capability of conveying the truth now we at many places we know that bureaucracy bureaucracy do not allow us to speak our mind speak our mind or um, express ourselves the truth that we want to and then that desire keeps on uh, haunting us at many places therefore like desire of telling the truth is always there and this desire at certain uh, certain certain point, points of ours also seen in ambivalence like in arara we see this ambivalence ambivalence with what the like desire like love is she is equiv equally uh, uh, equivalenting with power she is not only status it is also with status now how does it happen like uh, a celebrity when a celebrity enters a say for example a celebrity is coming in your campus all of a sudden the celebrity gets all the attention that uh, that is supposed to be and that is coming from the what you call status of that celebrity so this is what is very important in her poetry that she tries to talk about this as a desire uh, as a desire because status also brings uh, a kind of desire into everybody's mind today wherever you are standing tomorrow you want to move ahead the social ladder that's probably one of the up uh, upliftment that or opportunity that we all look into this is what she is commenting and and then when this thing from middle classes she comments uh, she also says that middle classes have lots of morality attached to it and therefore like when morality is attached to it language is always restricted and gender becomes regimented like this is a form you have to talk about this is the way you have to behave this is the way one should perform you should not do this you should not do that you should not wear these you should not wear that these are certain things that these kind of ambivalence we see in her poems whether it is in wild diaries the famous wild diaries or the triumph of achilles all the poem collection most of the poem collection you'll see these kind of things happening the other thing that comes in the desire is also self interrogation that we see in her poems a lot as in self interrogation she is trying to talk about 
certain kind of uh, alienation want to alienate yourself that only you will be able to able to reveal or able to talk about what uh, what exactly you are trying to take what exactly you are looking for the recoiling and the re uh, uh, the recoiling and the affirmation that you are making yourself uh, away from the crowd also leads to that it is not only that the, there then there is another uh, another very important thing there is a um, unscrupulous immediacy that we keep on seeing happening in our poems line of the line line of the line like in parable of the swans the uh, one two lines are the quote on the small lake of the whole the map of the world now when we say this the a small lake is carrying the whole map of the world now how does this matter then that means what you are reflecting uh, yourself like you yourself being a human being you can take the entire world's characters into yourself and then also the thoughts of yourself you can be a hindu still practice a non hindu activities you can be a muslim practice non muslim activities you can be a christian practice non christian activities these are certain things that she keeps on saying and what then um, from this she comes into the other part where she the third form that she always uses is nature therefore i quoted this uh, uh, parable of the swans lines meadowlands because when we talk about nature wild iris is a uh, selection which keeps on repeating in my mind it's not only about the flower that she is talking about it's not about the flower it's about the entity it's about the intelligence yeah you know she thinks that the emotive of a flower's color matters a lot because flower's color obviously spreads out emotions in, in inside you and that is what is very very important that is what is very important for any poet or any uh, readers of poetry it is very important to find out those meanings of why a red rose is talked about why daffodils are yellow why the uh, daisies are white or uh, why the tulips are different magnificent colors that we talk about she is basically trying to say over here that it is not only human self understanding uh, or it is also simultaneously the self consciousness that keeps on happening in our mind it is not that in wild iris she is talking about a deity a religion or, or someone who is like very powerful who can change everything who can change the world who can change the weather who can change anything now If you think of there are seasonal flowers, most of the flowers are seasonal. So what happens in the seasonal flowers is their death, their life, their mortality is a fixed thing. There is a fixed boundary of it. You cannot move beyond it. And this is where the self-consciousness comes in. Like if a flower's petals have to perish away after a certain time, why then there is a a uh, desire to have a uh, absolute knowledge what hegelian terms and using absolute knowledge is important then then what happens if you uh, seek for absolute knowledge obviously there will be a resentment and this resentment is a more most of the time she is referring to the judaism that uh, she comes uh, she uh, that is a part of her lineage and she do not believe in that uh, kind of resign uh, resentment she always says that there is multi layered emotions if a flower is lavender the flower is not only lavender to the ground it is also lavender to the sky it is lavender to the water it is lavender to the air and also very important issue is it is lavender to the fire all the five elements she is talking about so there are multiple when the lavender has so many references a human being emotion suppose you take happiness happiness has an extreme limit to the lowest limit all forms are all forms are happy you can be crazy and happy you can be ecstatic and happy you can be blissful and happy you can be beauty and happy and all the things and therefore when we try to resent these kind of happiness or this kind of emotions we always face disappointment and therefore when we talk about uh, the how uh, house of marshland when we talk about marshland uh, the house of Mar we see that she is bringing in uh, when she is talking about marshland she is becoming a romantic poet at certain point and she herself also refers that yes i i am i am fond of william blake a lot so this kind of romantic traits are also seen when she is writing this wild iris or the um, village life or uh, your know, 
major lands. All these poems, uh, collections, or Ararat, for example. And Ararat is, is another interesting collection, which uh, my personal favorite is, because it, there's a language. The language she is using is a language of disgust, a language of fear, a language of anger, as well as a language of warning. Mourning is not like, these are not a system, a systematic social, systematic systems that have to be placed in our social, systematic structures that have to be placed somewhere. But it is beyond that structure. It is beyond that symbol. It is beyond that symbolism that we are talking about. It is an identity. That is what is referring to us at many points. She talks about, um, therefore she talks about in her the collection that she has, a poetry collection from uh, 2010 to 14, 12 to 14, sorry. Uh, in that also she talks about uh, uh, the bomb, uh, the, uh, the uh, Twin Tower um, blast, and then she talks about season, she talks about existence. She talks about ethnic identity at many places. She talks about religious identity at many places. And very interestingly, all her poems, not only that I come from gender school, so I try to see gender everywhere, but there is also gender affiliation in most of her poems. Therefore, the identity politics that she uses is in a very literal, uh, literary evaluation that we can think of. And, and she resists those hyphenations. She doesn't like being called as Afro-American or uh, uh, Jewish American. She doesn't like all those terms. She says there should not be any kind of uh, iconoclasm. There should be an aura of, uh, aura of existence which is not in betweenness. This is not in betweenness. Therefore, in the post-model void that uh, she talks about existential crisis that you see in Faithful and Virtuous Night, we see existential crisis also being talked about a lot. And therefore, we, we have those landscapes which are talking about symmetry in city. We, you will see these references also with Eliot's poems a lot. Because when we talk about our uh, darkness in the early morning, you remember how um, this hollow man was talking about uh, uh, the darkness in the early uh, before the sunrise. That is what she is trying to bring many things together. But her, most of the poems refer, obviously, to, to two things that is very important for us is uh, not only as a confessional poet, but also as a reader of poetry. We try to see that the materials of poetry, the materiality of the poetry, that is symbols, syntax, diction, word, language, all have emotional responses in her poetry. All have. It is not that it is uh, one thing that has been talked about. All these are there. And when we talk about traumas, uh, uh, traumas, we have many flashbacks that are triggered from certain kinds of uh, senses, like senses of safety, sense of self, sense of self-efficacy, uh, or navigating relationship or sense of relationship. All these things bringing flashbacks or haunting memories like her sister's death and even her uh, disease that she had, uh, anorexia nervosa, keeps on repeating in her poem. And um, very interestingly, when we see this Holmes, uh, Holmes Robson too, uh, Rob Robinson tries to talk about her passion in nature, that how she is not only pre-linguistic, uh, pre uh, naturalism is also noted, but also romantic monoism is seen into her. Like if you re remember, she works in beauty, the poem, a romantic poem. Similarly, that kind of existential uh, monoism is seen in her poem. Uh, uh, over here, I would quote that uh, line from monologue at 9 a.m. It, it was a beautiful day, though cold. This was, for me, an extravagantly emotional gesture. Now, suppose that now it is a cold weather everywhere. Even in this coldness, you find beauty. That is what is very important for us. And this is where, like, uh, if you remember um, Eliot's poems, that's how Eliot is talking about our bodily uh, expressions. You see that how bodily or Eliot, both of them are talking about uh, you fit uh, first feet on the cold uh, floor makes a very important uh, courage uh, that, that has to be faced by every mortal life, that desire to wake up, that desire to leave the warm bed, 
in this world whether she talks about he, she talks about all the things in her poems so beautifully that emotions have no survival she says emotions is discontinuous emotions can be continuous with nature being part of it and before i end i would uh, quote from uh, one of her collections meadowland this is sooner or later i quote from the poem sooner or later in a long life together every couple encounters some emergency like this some drama which results in harm thank you thank you very much thank you so much uh, professor roy for your wonderful talk thanks again for <clears throat> taking out your time and uh, uh, talking uh, about uh, literature nobel prize uh, in this session thank you so much thank you uh, is there any question is there any question from the audience or from the youtube link youtube no no questions <laughs> okay from the participants any question uh, kaushik can i yeah yeah sure please adrin yeah so uh, dr himadri roy i am adrin from the department of humanities and social sciences yeah uh, first of all many thanks for such an enlightening talk uh, it is not a question it's actually a, a sort of clarification uh, you refer to baudelaire and eliot Mm -hmm. so is there a connection as regards the our association with the symbolist movement because a lot of symbolist uh, symbolist uh, uh, things are seen in the po i mean poems of uh, gluck so i was yeah. uh, curious to know whether there is uh, any yeah yeah there are definitely thank you edwin for bringing that question there are many because she says that there are uh, existential symbols i'll use some of the things that she has talked about one is a, a existential symbol where do come across uh, when we talk about existential symbols obviously bodilier's spleen or bodilier's many other poems come into our mind then mm -hmm. we talk about relational uh, symbols relational symbols in the sense of like representations of loneliness that is one mm -hmm. of her thing that keeps on repeating in her like she also talks about isolation which is not only solitude but also social pain being in public in being in a crowd you feel lonely that is what she is trying to talk about and therefore there are lots of references of eliot when we talk about like uh, like i was quoting this poem from um, quoting this poem from a uh, uh, monologue uh, um, from the collection averno the mm -hmm. monologue at 9 am where you talk about that the weather is beautiful the day is beautiful but cold Now yes. today, if the weather is beautiful, it is beautiful. Now we do not see that cold can also be beautiful. The cold feet can also be beautiful. The patches of the walls, the plasters that coming out can also be beautiful. That is how. That is what uh, like most many critics like Stanley Kunis tries to bring this philosophical nursing uh, musings together and trying to see that uh, the testing tree uh, or the what you call the forest bedding of the Japanese tradition, the forest bedding, all these things uh, they try to bring in her poem called uh, Abono or for example Meadowlands or Wild Iris or Ararat to some extent. and then also there are certain factors like objective vacations of language the linguistic pattern not only meta linguistics is being questioned but metaphysics are also questioned now when we talk about metaphysics being questioned it is not, then the family loneliness are being seen in her poem we when we talk about family loneliness we have the seven ages and vita nova being talked about a lot mm -hmm. i think sadrin i have been able to answer what you were asking yeah yeah thanks a lot yeah thanks a lot Thank you so much, Professor Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Prorikshit Ghosh. Uh, Dr. Ghosh uh, is uh, currently as a, an associate professor in the Department of Economics in the Delhi School of Economics. And Professor Ghosh, once again, uh, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and. agreeing to deliver a talk on the 
Nobel Prize in Economics for the year 2020. Thank you so much. So I'd like to invite you uh, for your talk. Thank you very much, Koshik, and uh, to the organizers in general for giving me this opportunity to participate in a confluence of minds and a celebration of uh, you know the best ideas that our uh, uh, species uh, comes up with every year. So um, this year's Nobel Prize in Economics goes to um, Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson for their contributions to auction theory. Um, both of them are economic theorists. So most of the work that they have done in their lives uh, involve mathematical modeling of uh, economic phenomena. Uh, and they have sort of brought it to, to the study of auctions. Uh, but in terms of auctions, they've gone a bit further. They have been very influential in what may be called market design. So they, at some point, they came down from the ivory tower and they helped uh, the US government to design spectrum license auctions. Uh, and uh, their design and the ideas related to that design uh, spread to many other countries. Many other countries adopted those things. And it has been the source of, you know, generous amounts of revenue for various governments. And it has relevance to India, too, because, you know, with spectrum licenses, we have had both controversies and uh, sort of uh, change that, uh, you know, the auction uh, format has been adopted of late. And again, borrowing from ideas, uh, partly coming from Milgram and Wilson's work. Uh, I should mention that, you know, this is uh, the, the price to Milgram and Wilson is also a celebration of the Guru Shishya Parampara, if you will, because Robert Wilson is was uh, one of the teachers, uh, thesis supervisors of Paul Milgram. Uh, and uh, some of his other students, uh, Wilson's other students in previous years have also won the Nobel Prize. So the teacher was a little late to the party in that sense. Uh, if you are interested in uh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, there's a little more detail in an idea in an article that I wrote for Ideas for India, the online portal. So on my slides, I have a link to that. And another useful source to to look into these issues a little further is, of course, you know uh, the the uh, review uh, by the Prize Committee, which you can find on their website. So the links to these two pieces are there. Um, so what I'm going to do in this talk, of course, I won't delve into a lot of, you know, the, sort of the mathematical structure, the technical details, and I'll try to convey to you the general ideas. And in doing so, I'll start, I'll rewind a little bit and start before Milgram and Wilson uh, and try to give you some of the intellectual antecedents of auction theory, well, where, where the questions and some of the analytical techniques came from. Uh, and then I'll get to, uh, their work uh, later in the talk. Uh, so, of course, perhaps the most famous quotation in, in the subject of economics comes from Adam Smith, who talked about the invisible hand, who said that, you know, uh, markets allocate resources uh, efficiently, um, in some sense, that although each person is trying to just satisfy his narrow wants, so in some sense, a greater common good comes about through the price system and the interaction of buyers and sellers in markets. Now, that statement, of course, has a lot of qualifiers. When, when you see it in economics textbooks, there are all kinds of exceptions, uh, things like externalities, like pollution, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the sort of basic expression of this idea comes through uh, kind of uh, model of markets, which goes back uh, more than a century to uh, economists like Leon Walras and Alfred Marshall and so on, uh, who built simple mathematical models where the assumption was that uh, in, a, in a free market, the price always adjusts so that demand and supply are equal. So there's no shortage or excess uh, demand. Um, and but the, those, those classical models or textbook models, if you will, don't have a very sophisticated uh, sort of insight into how prices come about. So if you look at the real world, if you go to the local fish market, for example, there's no central authority who's setting prices, right? If we, in, in the stock market, the New York Stock Exchange, there are market makers who have sophisticated computer algorithms uh, to make sure that the price uh, um, equates demand and supply. 
but that's not the case in the fish market. And if so, so the price forms through things like you know bargaining between individual buyers and sellers. Uh, and if you go to the wholesale market for vegetables, for many kinds of feed food items, the prices form through auctions in the mundis, right? So auctions are often very much part of the price formation process. So auction theory, in some sense, therefore, kind of digs into the underpinnings of price formation in markets. Uh, now, this, this entire question of whether, you know, if we adopt a certain system, whether it's capitalism, socialism, markets, uh, governments, what have you, uh, whether it achieves a certain end. Now, what is the end? What is the problem that we are trying to solve? And, and the basic economic problem is the allocation of scarce resources, right? So here's just sort of some random examples. You know, if there's a scarce painting, like a Picasso masterpiece, and there are many interested art collectors, who should get it? That is one resource, uh, one illustration of a resource allocation pro problem. If there are scarce seats in the stadium or the theater, who should get entry and who should be denied? Um, right now, we have a problem of vaccine allocation, right, with, with the coronavirus. So, so how should it be allocated? Who should get priority and who should be further down the line? Uh, a very relevant example for auction theory, and I'll, I'll keep referring back to it, is the allocation of these radio frequencies to various telecoms, right? And, and so who should get the uh, rights to use or the license to use a particular frequency and how should it be decided? That is the fundamental problem. Uh, now, an overarching possible response to this resource allocation problem is a principle which can, is, can be attributed to Karl Marx who said uh, that we should allocate resources in a way uh, so that um, uh, uh, from each according to his ability and to each according to his need, right? So if you're talking of uh, vaccines or healthcare, uh, the people with the most serious diseases should get priority. Um, and, uh, and payment should come from uh, those with, with high ability to pay. Now, many of us may be more than sympathetic to this principle. We may say that, oh, this is a fine way to, to structure society and the economy and uh, solve resource allocation problems. The, unfortunately, the, uh, when we try to take this principle to practice, there is uh, a problem of private information which uh, crops up. Right? So how do we know what each person's need is? Who, who needs a scarce resource more than others? Uh, that is often uh, known. So, so to take the spectrum allocation problem, right? Uh, ideally, the government should give the spectrum license to a company who can generate the most economic value with that. Right? But that sort of information is often uh, not easy to, to measure. Right? It depends on the company's technological know-how, its cost structure, et cetera. And that information is known to the company and not to the government who's trying to, trying to decide who should get the license. Uh, so this, in some sense, auction theory is, at least to, to a large extent, trying to implement Marx's principle, if you will, uh, to, to each according to his need. Um, while uh, solving this problem of private information. Now, the analytical uh, sort of tool, the main analytical tool of modern action theory and the mathematical models is the concept of Nash equilibrium. And uh, this was formulated by the mathematician John Nash. Uh, if you have seen the film, uh, A Beautiful Mind, uh, that's actually based on Nash's, Nash's life. Uh, it's a very uh, interesting and in many ways tragic life. Uh, he he uh, made uh, fantastic uh, contributions to mathematics and applied mathematics, uh, but but uh, fell prey to mental illness in his uh, 30s and lost many decades of his life. Uh, interestingly, in today's talk, the last talk is going to be the on the Abel lecture in mathematics, and Nash is uh, a rare person. I think, yeah, he has. Uh, I think he's the only person who has won the Nobel Prize as well as the Abel Prize, so, so he's special that way. Uh, so 
in game theory, so so the so the main tool of uh, uh, analyzing auctions is game theory uh, and the concept of Nash equilibrium. And the basic idea of a Nash equilibrium is the following: uh, games are situations of strategic interaction where my payoff or profit depends not only what I choose, but also on what some other players will choose, right? So I have to guess what other players uh, might might do, uh, what their stra strategies are going to be. So for example, if two farms are choosing their prices, uh, of course, uh, consumers will try to buy from the one with a lower price. So each farm has to try and guess what the other firm is going to do, uh, what, what price it's going to choose. So. The concept which Nash uh, formulated, which has become the idea of Nash equilibrium, is that it's strategic choices which have the self-fulfilling property, that each player is doing the best given the choices of the other players. Each player correctly anticipates what uh, other players are going to choose, and they ch make their own choices uh, to maximize their interests. In the context of auctions, that means each bidder the, the bidding behavior in auctions will be such that it's it's a self it has a self fulfilling prof, property. If all bidders expect other bidders to follow a certain bidding strategy, and in response, if they want to follow the same bidding strategy themselves, then that is what will be called a Nash equilibrium bid, bidding strategy, and that's the concept that is employed. Um, um, Now, uh, let's let's think the problem of a seller, like the government trying to decide who should get uh, spectrum licenses. Um, now, if the government, uh, op so, so other than auctions, there are uh, other options. So for example, the government may want to get hold of a telecom company like, you know, Airtel, let's say, and do face-to-face -face negotiations, do some sort of bargaining. Uh, the problem there is that if the, uh, if, if the, uh, buyer uh, has more information than the seller, then the seller will get a very raw deal. The buyer will be able to bring down the price to very, very low levels. Uh, so the seller is often better off committing to a non-negotiable price that the seller may want to commit never to lower the price and, and absolutely freeze it. But the problem with that uh, non-negotiable price is that it's a one size fits solution, right? So uh, you may end up overpricing it, in which case there's no buyers, or in, you may end up uh, underpricing it, in which case you leave money on the table. Auctions are better because they extract the private information. The government doesn't know the commercial value of the license to various, uh, uh, to various players, to various telecoms, but through the auction process, that information spills out. Uh, and the key there is competition. In a face-to-face -face negotiation, if you ask a company how much is the how much value do you place on this license? They will lie, they'll, they'll report downwards. But since they have to compete with other companies, that keeps them honest. And that competition is very key in bringing out the private information. And, bec and, and the other thing, uh, advantage of auctions is that it is flexible as a selling, uh, as a way of selling. So the price automatically adjusts high or low depending on whether the companies value the license a lot or, or not that much. Uh, so I'll very quickly try to convey the the you know this this uh, key idea of why auctions uh, may be better than fixed prices or negotiations uh, through an example. And the example is going to be very simple and cartoonish, but it, it it's meant to just convey the idea. So there are let's say two interested bidders for a license. And each of them, from this side, from the government side, it is known that each of them values it either at 80 rupees or 100 rupees. And let's say that value is determined through a toss of a coin. And only the companies know whether their own value is 80 or 100, right? Nobody else knows that. And, and let's say that that is determined through a coin toss, coin tosses, which are uh, statistically independent, right? So half and half probabilities. So if we compare a fixed price mechanism with a second price auction, what's the second price auction? That's where the highest bidder wins the object, but pays the second highest bid, the bid of uh, you know, whoever is, was closest to him uh, among the rest. Uh, so if you take this very simple example, uh, two possible values, 80 and 100, um, 
And suppose uh, the government adopts, thinks, thinks of adopting a fixed price, non-negotiable fixed price. Should they set the price at 80 or at 100? If they set the price at 80, the probability of sale is going to be one, right? Everybody values it 80 or more. So it will sell for sure. Uh, in fact, the coin has to be tossed to decide who gets it. And the revenue is 80. But if they charge 100, then there's a three-fourths probability that at least one guy will, will have a value of 100 and will, will be willing to pay that price. But there's a one-fourth probability that nobody will want to pay such a high price because they both value to 80. So in that case, the expected revenue or the average revenue over many trials would be 75. So, so the right, if, if you have to fix the price, you want to fix the price as 80 and not at 100, and uh, that will fetch this revenue. Now, let me show you why if you hold an auction instead, second price auction, on average, you'll make more money. The seller will raise more revenues. And also, the seller will make sure that the object always goes to the company who values it more. So, so suppose, uh, you know, there are, so there are, if, if you're holding a second price auction, there are sort of basically three possibilities, both valued at 80, both valued at 100, and one values it at 80 and the other at 100. And the probabilities are this, given independent coin tosses. And it's very easy to see that, you know, in the first two cases, the, the revenue raise will be 80, because over here, second price auction, right? This guy will bid 80 and this guy will bid 100 and, and the second price will be 80. By the way, the, it, is, it is a standard sort of result uh, that in a second price auction, it is a dominant strategy as we call it. It's, it's a strategy which beats any other strategy to bid your true value, right? So whatever the, is, is the value of the object to you, that is what you should bid because the price that you will pay is independent of your bid. So, so there's no need, you need to sort of shade it. So, uh, so with three-fourths probability, the selling price will be 80, and with one-fourth probability, it'll be 100. It'll always sell, uh, and the average money raised would be 85, right? And again, you see that this flexibility is the key, that the price automatically adjusts through the auction, that when needed, it, it remains low at 80, and when needed, it rises to 100. And, and that is the key. And the other thing is the company which has a higher value, if one of them has 80 and the other 100, will never have to toss a coin to decide. Uh, so so it'll, the auction design guarantees that it goes to the company which, which places a higher value and that is uh, efficient. Now, if you want to sort of take this sort of idea now to practice, you know, one problem is that auctions come in many forms. So in the real world, you have real-time auctions like the ascending bid uh, English auction. This is what we see in movies, right? Uh, in real time, the, the price is being raised. There are the descending bid Dutch auctions, which is practiced in flower markets in Holland. Uh, then there are closed bid sealed bid auctions. They're called closed auctions, like you know, government tenders. Right? Every, everybody, so for spectrum licenses, maybe many companies submit bids, how much they're willing to pay, and the highest bidder uh, wins, pays his own bid. Uh, but in, sometimes it's second price auction. The eBay auctions uh, are, are examples of second price auctions. You, you end up paying the second highest bid. So the question is, which kind of auction to choose? And the other question is, is there even in a theoretical sense, some even better method of selling? So uh, two of the economics of Nobel Prizes went to people who addressed this question, uh, William Vickery in 1996 and Roger Maas in, in 2007. And let me summarize the, the main lesson. Right? Their analysis was restricted to an assumed environment that is called independent private values. I'm going to explain that term in a moment, right? But it is a some kind of uh, auction environment. Uh, in that environment, they proved something called the revenue equivalence theorem, which says that of these standard auction formats, on average, they'll raise the same amount of money or revenue, right? There won't be any difference between them. Moreover, uh, if the reserve price is set at cost, then all of these auctions will be efficient. You cannot create any other way of selling which will fetch more money or, or um, well, actually, these, these auctions will make sure that the object goes to whoever values it most, because whoever values it more will always bid higher. Right. The bid function is, is increasing monotonically. Um, and all four auctions are revenue maximizing 
provided that a suitable reserve price is chosen. Uh, so the bottom line is this, uh, you know, we have had many controversies over, uh, you know, the 2G spectrum when, when initially the government uh, adopted allocation rules which were not auction based and there was a suspicion that that led to corruption and so on and so forth. So one objective there is to lower corruption. Another possible objective is uh, efficiency that make sure that the company who can make the most of it uh, wins, wins the license. And the third possible objective is to make the most amount of money for the government, revenue maximization. So what this analysis says is that there's hardly any kind of conflict between these objectives and auctions are really the magic solution that uh, auctions uh, maximize on all three fronts and there's no trade-off really between them. Now, um, that being said, as I said, I use this term independent private values and, and I want to uh, talk about this. Um, elaborate on that. So, so here's uh, a curious thing which was found uh, that the uh, American government, you know, for many years have been auctioning off oil drilling rights in the Gulf of Mexico to various oil companies. And three people did an analysis of these auctions uh, and the auction data and they found that the winners of these auctions often lost money in the sense that if they took the same capital and put it in the bank, uh, they would have actually earned more. So, so they really came out on the losing side and, and systematically so, uh, almost always. And so, so what was the reason for that? And the reason for that is the winner's curse. So if I show you a picture of a jar of pennies, let's say, and just for a few fleeting seconds, and I ask you to guess how many pennies there are, or a jar of coins, let's say each is a one rupee coin, right? So, and, and I tell you that you will have to bid in an auction for that jar. And of course, the value of the jar is equal to the number of coins inside. And if I just show it to you fleetingly like this and then take it away, uh, then of course you won't be able to perfectly count. You don't have enough time. So you'll have to form an I estimate, right? Uh, so think of that. Now, there are different kinds of auctions. Uh, if a painting is being sold to art collectors, that's the great case of private values, right? It depends on my aesthetics, uh, how much I'm willing to pay. Maybe I like Picasso, but hate Dali, so I'll be willing to pay more for Picasso. Uh, and I don't care what others think. You may think Dali is better, but that's you, that's not me. But for the coin uh, jar of coins or for the oil drilling rights, right? It's common values, meaning that the amount of oil under the ground is the same, no matter who wins. So the commercial value of that thing at the end of the day is the same. And that's called common values. And sometimes you can have a combination of common and uh, private values. So the main contribution of uh, this year's Nobel laureates, Milgram and Wilson, is to take the analysis of auction theory to situations involving common values. And that's also true for spectrum licenses uh, to, to, to some extent. There's a common value component because, you know, it depends on market conditions, etc. And everybody faces the same market. Uh, so the traditional results that I talked about due to Milgram, uh, due to uh, Vickrey and Marson, they were too restrictive, uh, the private values case. So, so they developed the apparatus to understand common values. Uh, and so, so let me tell you about that. Now, going back to the winner's curse problem that I just mentioned, right? What is, let's uh, try to understand that, uh, what's going on there. Uh, so if some people, a bunch of people are bidding on the jar of coins or on the oil lease uh, contract, uh, they're all trying to form rough estimates of what the value may be. And all of them are off. Some are off too high and some are off too low. Uh, now, if you take the guesses of a bunch of people, the average of their guesses would be quite accurate, especially if there's a large number of people. And that follows from the law of large numbers in statistics, right? The mean, sample mean captures the population mean if the sample size is large. But, and that is the foundation of uh, concepts like the wisdom of crowds. But if you look at the winner, the winning bidder is not somebody who's, who's made an average guess, it's somebody who has made the highest guess of all the people, right? And the highest guess always turns out, I mean, almost surely turns out to be an overestimate. So, so here's a cartoon to kind of illustrate that. A bunch of cats are trying to guess 
how many, how many fish are there in this container. And this green one is the average and he probably wouldn't be too far off. But the one who's most eager, who uh, kind of wins the auction is the one with the, with the highest guess. And that's almost always an overestimate. So these companies were not taking this sort of subtle statistical trap into account. They were sincerely going by their estimates and, and whoever won ended up paying too much. Uh, so Wilson in a paper, he said, okay, but rational bidders will soon wisen up to this and they'll start shading their bids because of the winner's curse so that they avoid the winner's curse. So he took that into the mathematical model and he analyzed what happens. Now, when bidders start shading their bids, unfortunately, what happens is that uh, the seller's revenue starts going down, right? So the seller has to now worry about it. Um, and a classic paper, which is really sort of uh, pins down the auction design problem in, in um, common value context is the paper by Milgram and Weber from 1982. Uh, and they proved a result called the linkage principle, which lies at the heart of what I'm going to say um, here. Uh, what Milgram and Weber proved is that if a seller is holding an auction, and if the seller can find some way or, or can commit to reveal information about the value of the object. So for example, the government selling oil tracks may invite uh, you know, uh, engineers to do some exploration and make that information public. Right. And that can go both ways. Sometimes the engineers will report good news that there seems to be a lot of oil there. And sometimes they'll reveal bad news that this seems to be relatively more, more barren tract. And so good news will increase the selling price and be good for the government. Bad news will, will lower it. But what they proved is that on average, if you do the expectation, uh, the commitment to reveal information this way is actually revenue increasing. And it's revenue increasing because uh, when bidders get more precise information, they shade their bids less and they're less afraid of the winner's curse. And, and that's why uh, average revenues uh, goes up. So, so you can summarize this, this as honesty is the best policy on the part of sellers. They, they should commit to reveal all possible information available out there. Uh, now, here is the, here is the key thing. Uh, what uh, Milgram and uh, Wilson's analysis shows that when we have common value environments, when the seller is not trying to sell an art object, the seller is trying to uh, sell oil tracks or spectrum licenses, the four auctions are no longer revenue equivalent, right? So this sort of broad property that it doesn't matter how you design the auction, you know, just hold an auction, any of the standard formats, uh, everything will be fine. That is no longer true. And the seller, the designer, the government, whoever is doing it has to be much more discerning, much more careful in, in coming up with an auction format. Uh, and they, for a single object sale, they proved that the highest revenue comes from the English auction followed by the second price auction followed by the Dutch and other auctions. The reason the English auction, what is the English auction? It's an auction where the price starts very low and it's being raised and bidders start dropping off at various points, right? Somebody says, oh, this high price has got to a level where I can no longer buy, so leaves the room. And, and so uh, eventually price rises to a point where only one bidder remains and, and wins at that price. So that's the English auction. Now the English auction has an inbuilt property that it generates information in particular, when bidders see other bidders leaving the room, they learn how much their estimate was of the, of the object's value. And they keep factoring that into their calculation. And the linkage principle says that any kind of you know, information that is brought to the table in, in, a, in an auction, uh, in a common value environment, uh, increases revenues for the seller. So, uh, so, so that was their main contribution. And then in the spectrum sale case, what happened is that you know, the problem became much more complicated because not, uh, what was being sold was not a single spectrum frequency, but a whole bunch of them. And there were synergies, possible synergies. So a company could uh, value one license at 100, another at 200, but if it got both of them in a bunch, it could be worth 400 or 500 to them. Uh, so, so the auction design has to has to take into account this this synergy, 
And so the government actually, the US government in 1994 invited uh, design ideas from, from various uh, auction theorists and uh, Milgram and Roberts's idea was the one which was accepted, which is called a simultaneous multi-round auction format. So all, all of the uh, licenses are placed on the table at the same time and people bid. And at each round, there's a provisional winner for each of them. Uh, uh, but, but the idea is that uh, the sales uh, will happen uh, simultaneously. Uh, and, and the whole auction ends when nobody wants to raise the bid for any one of the, of the objects. Um, so this was very successful. You know, what was the, the revenue expectations were vastly exceeded. So the, so the 1994 auction generated more than half a billion dollars. And that was that was much above uh, what people had expected, and it was splashed on the New York Times, and that's when uh, their names started coming in the public domain. Uh, and since then, um, there have been many auctions, and and this kind of design has been imported to other countries, including India, some some version of it, and has raised uh, a lot of uh, money. Uh, so I will end. Um, I try to convey the, the sort of basic contribution and of, of Milgram and Roberts. I should mention that, you know, they have, especially Paul Milgram is one of my favorites. He has a lot, and, lot of um, important work in economic theory, which has nothing to do with auctions. Some of them I teach in class, uh, but um, that's, uh, this is not the occasion to, to uh, talk about them. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ghosh, uh, for an illuminating uh, talk. Now, any question from the audience? Or any question from the YouTube channel? No questions from the YouTube. I think it looks like there is a question in Zoom. Just check. OK. So there is a question from Ronak. Uh, Sir, can you please explain uh, the synergy concept that you mentioned in the multi-unit slide? Yeah. Um, um, yes. So sometimes when, you know, uh, there are uh, different objects being sold, right? So, so uh, an auction house is selling a painting and uh, an antique uh, table, right? Uh, now, uh, they are pretty independent. So how much I value the painting and how much I value the antique table, maybe basically statistically independent draws. So there, even though you're selling multiple objects, you don't have to worry uh, because, because they are essentially separate problems, right? You, you uh, sell it, you treat each sale as, as a separate problem. Uh, but if you're selling, um, you know, uh, an antique table and some antique chairs, they can go together. So somebody who gets, who wins the table as well as the chairs will probably high value the package more than, you know, the sum of the, it's, it's more than the sum of the parts. And that makes the auction design problem much more complicated. And now you have to think about, should I sort of hold separate auctions or should I sort of tie them together? How should I tie them together? Uh, so, so that the synergy gives rise to a much more complex and holistic problem. And, and, and that's uh, what, uh, you know, where Milgram Roberts have some important uh, design suggestions, uh, ideas which have been put into practice. Any other question? Um, hello, hello, Dr. Kaushik, this is Deb Dulal. Yes, Deb Yeah, Deb I, uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, just, I am just curious, what, what, what if uh, when information is asymmetric in that kind of situation, how it happens in the auction market? Yes. So actually, the entire analysis is based on asymmetric information, right? So, so you know, the spectrum license auctions, each company has a good estimate of its own value. How much is it worth? How, how much is the license worth to them? So Airtel knows their own value, Vodafone knows, and Geo knows, and so on. But... Um, they have much less idea about how much the other company values it. And so does the government. So it is asymmetric information right off the bat and the auction models, absolutely it is at the core of the auction models. 
Yes, uh, there's possible asymmetric information about one of the things which, uh, since you ask, I can maybe tie it into to the question which you ask. See, for example, right now we are facing problems, uh, you know, this grave matter of, of uh, allocating vaccines. Yes. So the key idea in auctions is that whoever values something more will be willing to pay more and bid more. And so the auction design will send that scarce resource their way. Now that works well in a world of equality. In a world of inequality, another dimension is uh, that uh, uh, the ability to pay, right? So, so a high bid uh, or a low bid may reflect low need, but it may also reflect low ability to pay. So, so you know, Africa, some African countries may have a desperate situation uh, with the disease, but they won't be able to outbid richer countries, uh, not, not because their need isn't higher, but because their, their budgets are limited. And so I think one important direction of auction theory, which is, is the second aspect of asymmetric information or, or heterogeneity. And, and there is literature not contributed by Milgram and Roberts. Uh, it, the great paper is Che and Krebs, uh, which, which takes this into account. And, and the upshot is that you have to brunt the force of competition a little bit. Instead of this breakneck competition, everything is determined by bids and prices you have to combine them with lotteries that some of the vaccine may be given out by lotteries to people or countries and some other part may be kept open to, to a bidding war. Thank you, thank you. Okay, if uh, there is no other question, I will again thank uh, Professor Ghosh. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. With this now, we will uh, move toward the next speaker, Krishnandu Gangopadhyay. And Krishnandu will be talking about the Abel Prize in Mathematics for the year 2020. Krishnandu. Okay, so thank you. So am I audible? Yes. Okay. So let me share my screen. I hope it is visible. So thank you uh, very much to the organizers and to the former head mathematics for inviting me uh, to this nice uh, Abel Nobel laureate seminar of Aisar Mohani. It's a pleasure. So I will be speaking about Abel, the work of Abel Prize laureates 2020. Now, as all of you know, by this time, the uh, Abel Prize is given by Norwegian Academy of Science uh, since 2003. It's one of the most prestigious award in mathematics. Mathematics has no Nobel Prize because of some strange reason, but now we have Abel Prize and there is another one which is for younger mathematicians, that's called Fritz Nobel. Now this year's Abel Prize uh, is given to Hilal Furstenberg from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Israel, and Grigori Marmulis. Uh, he is a Russian-American mathematician, currently working at Yale University in the United States. Now here, uh, here are the pictures of Hilary Frostenberg, uh, who is uh, 84 years old, and uh, a screen is not entirely visible. Uh, well, uh, is it visible to everyone? Or, or, I don't know why it is not. Yes, it is visible, sir. Okay, fine. So here it is Hilal Frostenberg, who is now 85 years old. And the other picture is, is by uh, of Grigori Margulis, who is now around 75. Now, as per the citation, these two mathematicians have been given the Abel Prize for pioneering the use of methods from probability and dynamics in group theory, number theory, and combinatorics. Now, uh, I mean, uh, so in the following, I will give a very, very light overview of their works. Now, I my apology to my mathematician friends, because I will not be very precise, because the work of Furstenberg and Markulis are, you know, Tremendous, and uh, it's not possible to describe uh, describe the it's not possible to describe the entire work. Uh, 
well uh, in a half an hour now what is saying that screen is sharing is paused okay so let me see what is the problem here yeah there is some problem so i stop sharing and i will share it again let me see i hope it is visible now yeah okay good so it is visible it's visible now yeah okay so this, i don't know the screen was i mean screen sharing was paused for some technical reason but now i hope it is visible if not then please unmute yourself and let me know because i cannot read the chat all the time so please uh, unmute yourself and let me know uh, that I would, that i would appreciate very much all right so uh, i will uh, quickly go to the okay sorry i will quickly uh, give the brief biographies of this mathematician so firstenberg he is born in berlin in 1935 and belongs to a jewish family very orthodox jewish family uh, his father managed to flee to united states just before the starting of the world war 2 and then died there when firstenberg was very young uh, i think he was uh, at his very early years around 5 or 6 so since then uh, hilden frostenberg was raised by mother along with uh, his siblings now he was very meritorious from the beginning and he was very curious during his school life itself about mathematics he started publishing papers research papers from a, from a very early age uh, during his undergraduates Uh, he went to princeton university for phd and uh, finished it in 1958 in 1961 he, he was appointed as an assistant professor at the university of minnesota and he became full professor within 4 years but he decided to move back to israel and he joined hebrew university of jerusalem in 1965 and is still continuing there as a emeritus professor now he has won some very prestigious awards uh, like Pulitzer prize in mathematics and the israel prize so the israel prize is the highest scientific honor in israel which is like a world heritage award so this was a brief biography of hilden frostenberg now gregory margulis i mean his life is i think more colorful than frostenberg because he has more struggles in life so he was born in moscow in 1946 he was also uh, shown his talent at an early age he won the silver medal at the international mathematical olympiad in 1962 uh, he finished his phd in 1970 at moscow state university under yakov sinai so yakov sinai is another abel laureate who won the abel prize in 2014 so margulis uh, did his phd in 1970 and i must mention here that margulis was also from Jewish background, and because of uh, his uh, Jewish origin, he struggled to get a job in Moscow, and he joined some uh, some university which which is meant for you know networking and information uh, processing. All right, so he did not get a regular job, but he joined this temporary job there, and there he, he developed something that I will come towards the end. but eventually he get into mainstream mathematics and he did uh, excellent work in the theory of lie groups and he invented something called which, which is now called margulis super relativity theorem and for this work he won the fields medal in 1978 when he was only 32 however soviet authorities thought that if he went if he goes to take the fields medal in helsinki it will be Uh, against their national security and so denied him permission to go abroad now he eventually got permission only in 1979 when soviet academicians were given more personal freedom and uh, less uh, restriction uh, so he decided to visit europe during 1980 and several universities in europe from 1980 to 1990 
Eventually, he settled at the Yale University in the United States. So Margulis has also won the Wolf Prize. He has won the Dobacheski Prize, other than the Fields Medal. And now he has won the Apple Prize. The work of Margulis is very deep and profound. And works of three recent Fields Medalists has its root in the work of Margulis. So these are the Fields Medalists, Elon Lindelstrauss, Maria Mirzakhani, and Akshay Venkatesh. So they, they won the Fields Medal in all in the last maybe 12 years, and all of their works uh, has origin in the work of Margulis and to some extent in the work of Frostenberg as well. So I really cannot do, uh, give a very broad view of their work in this short time, but what I will do, I will give you a very broad side view. So Frostenberg and Margulis were among the very first mathematicians who used probabilistic methods to understand some profound problems in abstract mathematical areas. Now, before the work of Furstenberg and Margulis, probabilistic methods were considered as applied mathematics and it was not so important. Uh, it was mostly confined within applicable areas. But these people have brought back to mainstream mathematical science and they have it is now a part of our mainstream mathematical areas. So they used, so Furstenberg especially, used the, and also Margulis to some extent, used the concept of random works in probability theory to understand deep structure about symmetries, or which we call groups. Now they introduced far-reaching ideas and surprising connection between areas which apparently are not connected to each other. So I will come to it. Now before I give a summary of what they have done mostly, let me give a quick introduction to some of the mathematical concepts for a layman. So the first concept is that of randomness. So now imagine you were in the center of a room and you were throwing a squash ball all around the room. Now, how many times the ball bounced and passed a given spot? That information gives you some idea of the shape and size of the room. So the general idea is to use the trajectory of an object to reveal information about the space it is traveling. And the area of mathematics that do this is called ergodic theory. So you associate a measure to the space and try to understand estimate of the size of a object by looking at the trajectory of the underlying function, the measured function. And another object in mathematics is called groups. So I, it's, it's, it's one of the very first course that we teach at Aysan Mohadi. So now, what is a group? A group is a mathematical object that represents symmetry in the nature. Now, mathematically, a group is a set equipped with a binary operation such that the binary operation is closed in the set. So if you apply A and B, you relate them by the binary operation, A star B will be in G. There is a unique element one that gives you the same element under the binary operation, which is called identity element. And for every A in G, you have an inverse. So which you compose with the element A, then it gives back to you the identity element. And there is certain associativity relation. So a group is an object uh, which uh, is a set with a binary operation of this kind. Now it represents symmetries in the nature, uh, which we can uh, understand by using some basic examples, but I will uh, request you to take it for granted at the moment because my aim is to give you the work of the Abel laureates. Now, what they work, are, the object on which they work is called Lie groups. So, so like a group represents the symmetries in the nature. So Lie groups are objects that describe the symmetries of geometrical objects in the nature. So mathematically, a Lie group is a group that is smooth everywhere. 
and the binary operation also behaves smoothly. So by smooth, I mean you take a point and you can draw a, tan a tangent plane or a tangent space depending on the dimension you are taking everywhere on this object. In other words, there is no local bumps which is like zigzag. There is no cone points like this. So roughly that is what is a smooth structure and a regroup is a smooth manifold where the binary operations are also smooth. Now it is named, at, the Lie groups are named after Norwegian mathematician Sokus Lee, who came up to these objects as symmetries of differential equation. So Sokus Lee was studying differential equation and he wanted to understand the symmetry associated to the solutions of differential equations. And that's how he invented Lie groups. Now, one example of Lie groups are the rotational symmetries in the three dimensional space. So you are in a three dimensional space, you consider the set of all possible rotations in the three dimensional space. That will give you an example of a Lie group. Now, summary of the works of Margulis and Furstenberg. So they have invented concepts, techniques, and theorems to contribute significantly in the understanding of Lie groups using tools from ergodic theory. So that's the three line, that's a one line summary of their work. And <clears throat> they have also applied these concepts and ideas to solve other uh, problems in other areas, especially number theory. So this is the brief summary of the work of Frostenberg and Margulis for which they have got Fields Medal and it's a tremendous amount of work. So as I mentioned, I cannot give uh, a detailed overview of both of their work in half an hour, but I will give a few samples. Now, here is one of the sample for Furstenberg's work. So, there is a theorem called Zemeredi's theorem in number theory. <coughs> so, in number theory, an arithmetic progression is a sequence of integers with fixed difference. For example, you take the sequence of integers 5, 8, 11, 14, 17, where the difference is 3, or the other set which I have written here, say minus uh, 8, minus 5, minus 2. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not arithmetic progression, it will be minus uh, 3 here. Uh, yeah, minus is fine. So minus 5, minus 2, uh, 0, 3, 6. So here also the difference is 3. So this is another arithmetic progression. So this sort of uh, number system, sequence of numbers is called the arithmetic, arithmetic progression and the density of a set A of integers uh, is given by the probability of an arbitrary chosen integer to be a member of the set A. Now Zemeredi's theorem uh, which appeared in 1975 is the following that you take any integer K and let A be a set of integers with positive density, then A contains a non-trivial arithmetic progression of length K. So this gap in the arithmetic progression is called the length of the arithmetic progression. So this is what uh, is Zemeredi's theorem. And this theorem was a conjecture of Paul Erdos and Turon, uh, who made it earlier, and Zemeredi solved it. But in 1977, Furstenberg gave another proof of this result using a completely different kind of technique, which is the idea of recurrence. Now, in uh, what the theorem that Furstenberg proved is called Furstenberg Multiple Recurrence Theorem, and Zemeredi's theorem is actually a corollary to the theory, this uh, multiple recurrence theorem now. Now, what Furstenberg did, he relate the uh, finding of an arithmetic progression to the dynamics of recurrence. And that is what has been exploited in the proof. Now, here is a statement of the theorem. You start with the integer, take a measure preserving system on the set of all integer Z. Uh, I, I, I will not discuss what is a measure preserving system, but roughly you give a measure on Z and you associate a, I mean, a function which preserves the measure and uh, that's what the measure preserving system on Z, roughly. And you take E to be a set of positive measure inside the set of all integers. Then, uh, Furstenberg's uh, recurrence measure theorem 
says that this set E, when you take its intersection under the recurrence of the function T, then this intersection will be empty. Now, if you relate this set A in the Zemeredis theorem to E, you thought E as the set A and the function T as the translation of the set of integer Z, then A contains no, uh, then if A contains no arithmetic progression, this intersection uh, will be empty. And that's what was the idea of Frosted Group. All right. Uh, other than giving this deep proof of uh, or more general version of Zemeredis theorem, another concept that Furstenberg invented and it is widely used is that is called Furstenberg boundary. Now, Furstenberg associated to every Lie group a notion of a boundary, which is now known as Furstenberg boundary. Uh, Furstenberg obtained this notion in order to generalize the classical integral Poisson formula for harmonic functions on the unit disk. Now, essentially, to every Lie group, uh, you, if you take a Lie group G and a, uh, another connected Lie group H, then the quotient, you can realize that as a nice space. And this notion of Furstenberg boundary gives a compactification for this space because the space is open. Now to compactify, you need to attach some sort of boundary so that the points cannot move away uh, from the boundary. And this Furstenberg boundary exactly uh, did that job. Now this uh, compactification is widely used in mathematics and has several applications. Now, now uh, these are the two samples of Furstenberg's work that I wanted to tell you. Now I will come to the work of Margulis. So Margulis also used dynamics. So now in Furstenberg's case, the dynamics is the dynamics of a function on a measure space. But for Margulis, the dynamics is different kind of dynamics. It's dynamics on Lie group or the dynamics on homogeneous spaces associated to Lie groups. Now using this dynamics, uh, Margulis solved one famous conjecture in number theory. Now, let me state that conjecture is called Oppenheim conjecture. Now, consider the expression of this form, qx, ax square plus B, by square plus cz square. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, if you know uh, plus 12 coordinate geometry, then this sort of, the solution of this sort of expression gives you a conic in the three-dimensional space. Right? Now, this sort of expression is uh, more generally called as quadratic form in mathematics. Now, the definition is the following, that you start with a vector space B over a field of scalars. Uh, here, my field of scalars is real number. K is a typo here. It's real numbers. I'm taking only real numbers here. Then a quadratic form is just a function from the vector space to the scalar, uh, the field of real numbers, such that when you multiply a vector v by a scalar a and apply the quadratic form q, then it gives you a square times q of t. And uh, this expression q u, u plus v minus q u, u minus q v, this is a bilinear map. So these two properties define a quadratic form over real numbers, and q is indefinite if it is neither strictly not negative or it is neither strictly non-positive. That means it takes both positive and negative values, then it is called indefinite. Uh, it is called non-degenerate if there is no vector which is orthogonal to every other vector. All right. Now, in, in 1884, a old theorem of Mayer, it says that if you take Q to be an indefinite quadratic form in at least five variables over the with rational coefficient, that means all these A, B, C are rational numbers, then the solution, uh, if the quadratic form has a non-zero solution in the field of real numbers, then it has also a non-zero integer solution. And the number five here is sharp. For example, the quadratic form that I have written here, 
x1 square plus x2 square minus 3 times x3 square plus x4 square. This has no integer solution. Now, Oppenheim generalized this Mayer's theorem using a more general setup, and he gave, a, I mean, in Mayer's theorem, your quadratic form should have a solution, but in Oppenheim's conjecture, he approximated the solution in a small uh, neighbor, epsilon neighborhood. So the Oppenheim conjecture states the following, that you take a real non-degenerate indefinite quadratic form in at least three variables. Suppose the coefficients of u are not rational numbers. So you allow irrational numbers to be the coefficients of the quadratic form. Then for, every, for any epsilon greater than zero, there is a non-zero rational vector x such that the absolute value of qx can be made less than epsilon. So this is a very uh, number theoretic statement. And apparently it has no connection with Lie groups or anything else. But uh, yeah, one remark that this conjecture is not true for two variables, it follows from a well-known estimate in algebraic number theory. So the conjecture is stated at the most general form in this setup. Now, Oppenheim conjecture was proven by Margulis in 1987 using methods uh, on uh, using ergodic theory methods in Lie groups. Now, apparently, this is a purely a statement about quadratic form, but there was an idea that relates the Oppenheim conjecture with the geometry of unipotent subgroups of certain Lie groups. And it was essentially the work of Indian mathematician M. S. Raghunathan who related the Oppenheim conjecture uh, to that of this uh, theory of unipotent flows in Lie groups. And Raghunathan made a conjecture on a closure of unipotent orbits that implies the Oppenheim conjecture. Now, Margulis, uh, uh, when he started traveling during 1979, 1980s, he visited Max Planck Institute in Bonn and he met one of Raghunathan's collaborator, Gopal Prasad there. So this Margulis has written himself in some uh, document and I am just uh, recalling the story from there. So Gopal Prasad told Margulis about Raghunathan's conjecture and his relation with Oppenheim's conjecture. So Margulis was very thrilled knowing this relation. And earlier, Margulis had some work on unipotent flows in dynamical system. So after knowing this relation, Margulis uh, thought that those ideas may be useful in proving Raghunathan's conjecture. And he actually proved Raghunathan's conjecture for SL3R. So one comment that I have written here that, I mean, though Raghunathan's conjecture is very general, but the Oppenheim's conjecture can be reduced entirely to this uh, case of three by three real matrices or the, to the dimension to the case n equal to three. So here, if you prove it for n equal to three, then you prove it for everything else. And this n equal to three case is related to the theory of unipotent flows of uh, uh, SL3R. Now what happened here, uh, you take a indefinite quadratic form in dimension three. Now, it's a you know basic theorem in linear algebra. It's called Sylvester's law of inertia, that the only indefinite quadratic form that you can get in dimension three is that of signature two comma one, and the isometric group there is denoted by a sub two comma one. Now, Raghunathan's conjecture states that if you take a point in this uh, homogeneous uh, space, SL3R mod SL3Z, then for a point Z, you take the orbit of Z under this isometric group SO2,1. Now, if the orbit closer is compact, then the orbit itself uh, is compact. And that means this quotient SO2,1 mod the stabilizer at Z is compact. 
So this is what Raghunathan conjectured. So it's a part of a more general conjecture of Raghunathan, which I will mention shortly. Now, Margulis proved this conjecture using theory of unipotent flows in Lie groups, and that implied the Oppenheim conjecture. Now, following this work, there have been many works uh, on this direction. One of the, so immediately after the work of Margulis, another Indian mathematician, S.G. Dani, who also played an incremental role in developing this theory. So Dani and Margulis proved the following result. They proved that the orbits of SO2,1 in SL3R mod SL3Z are either closed or dense. And as a consequence, Dani Margulis also proved a version of Raghunathan's conjecture. Now, uh, the general version of Raghunathan's conjecture was open for a long time, and then in early, in I think late 90s, uh, Maria Ratner uh, proved the Raghunathan's uh, conjecture, which, which was the general conjecture also had a contribution by Dani. So Maria Ratner proved the Dani Raghunathan conjecture in full generality. And there is a very nice uh, text which is called Ratna's Theorem on Unipotent Flows by David Victor Morris, uh, where you can get a nice exposition of this uh, uh, theory and the proof of Ratna's theorem of the conjecture of Dani and Raghunathan. So this was a brief uh, uh, story about the Oppenheim's conjecture. Now I will mention another uh, fundamental contribution of Margulis, uh, which is actually a very small result, which we call lemma in mathematics, but it's a very, very deep and which has many applications in geometry. So it is called the Margulis lemma. Now the Margulis lemma is a result about discrete subgroups of isometric groups of non-positively curved manifolds. Now we can since we have already mentioned about indefinite quadratic form uh, in uh, uh, dimension 3, which is SO2,1. Uh, so you can think of, of everything boils down to I mean, everything uh, in the setup of SON,1, uh, which is the quadratic, so which is the isometric group of quadratic form of signature N,1 for real numbers. Okay, I mean, the Margulis lemma is more general, but here I will state uh, for simplicity only this case for SON, comma 1. Now you take a discrete subgroup of, so this uh, group SON, comma 1 is important in geometry because it is also the isometric group of the hyperbolic space. So the hyperbolic space is the unique, you know, co contractible, uh, simply connected, nice space of constant negative curvature in geometry. And uh, you, if you take the surfaces, the surfaces in our uh, nature, then most of the surfaces are modeled, locally modeled on the hyperbolic uh, spaces. So that's why I have chosen uh, this group, SON, comma 1, and I, I will give you a brief uh, statement of Margulis lemma for SON, comma 1. Now you start with a discrete subgroup of SON, comma 1, then a point x in the hyperbolic space and a number epsilon greater than 0, consider the set gamma epsilon x, which is the group generated by those elements g, so that the distance of gx and x is less than epsilon. Now Margulis lemma states that for each dimension n, there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that for every discrete subgroup gamma of SO n comma one, and for every point x on the hyperbolic hyperbolic n-dimensional space, this group gamma epsilon x has finite orbit. So this is the statement of Margulis lemma for SO n comma one. So essentially, it says that you know, you can think of this gamma epsilon x as a tube inside uh, this group, discrete group, uh, 
uh, or I mean, uh, yeah. So, so this group has finite orbit uh, for any point on the hyperbolic space. Now, equivalently, this group has an abelian subgroup of finite index. So one can prove that if a discrete group has a finite orbit on the hyperbolic space, then equivalently that means it has an abelian subgroup of finite index. Now, what is the geometric consequence of this result? So as I told you that if you take the two-dimensional hyperbolic plane, then most surfaces in the nature, there is a complete classification of surfaces in terms of their genus. So the picture here is the surface of genus three. So that means uh, this number of holes in a surface, uh, you can call that as a genus. Now, you take any surface of genus G, at least two, then that is locally modeled on the hyperbolic plane. And the injectivity radius of a surface uh, is the largest radius around the point P for which uh, the exponential map is a diffeomorphism. So the exponential map is a map that one can give from the tangent space to the ambient surface. Now this map is not all of this map can be very complicated, but for locally injectivity radius is the largest radius for which the exponential map is a diffeomorphism. Now, Margulis lemma implies that if you, you can divide your surface into two parts, one part is the thin part, which is uh, the set of all points on the surface whose injectivity radius is less than epsilon, and the set of all points uh, in the surface whose injectivity radius is greater than or equal to epsilon. So every surface is a disjoint union of a thick part and a thin part, and a corollary to the Margulis lemma gives you a very solid understanding of the thin part. So as a consequence of the Margulis lemma that I have stated, which is about the orbit of a certain subgroup of the discrete group, but you can apply that understanding to the case of the underlying surface, and one can see that each component of the thin part is either of the following two types. Either it is an annulus and look like this, up to homeomorphism, or it is a cusp. So it's, it's a long funnel where the end goes thinner and thinner. So Margulis lemma gives you a nice decomposition of the whole surface into a thick part and a thin part. And uh, here I have stated it for surface, but it's more general. You can do it for any non positively curved uh, Riemannian manifold. And now, uh, and, and you know, I mean, when you study the geometric properties of these manifolds, uh, this understanding is very useful. So, that is another work of Margulis. Now, finally, I want to uh, tell you about. Uh, work of Margulis in the combinatorial setting. So now, as I told you, that after his PhD, Margulis struggled to get a job because of some problem in his country, but eventually he joined a center for information processing and technology. So there, he contributed to the theory of expander graphs. So now a graph, we all know what is a graph. So a graph with only a few edges is called a sparse graph. Now an expander graph is a sparse graph that has strong connectivity properties. And expander graphs have many applications in computer science. And in real life also, you can see lots of examples of expander graph. One example is that when you go to Delhi Metro, there is this map connecting different stations on the display board, uh, giving uh, several uh, lines of the metro network. So that's an example of a expander graph. Now, Margulis, so before Mar Margulis, before the work of Margulis, it was not known how to construct expander graphs uh, 
nicely. But Margulis gave a beautiful construction of a family of expert graphs in 1973, and which has been proven to be very useful in this theory. Now, this was a very small overview of the work of Margulis and uh, Kostenberg. Now, their work is profound, deep, and uh, there are many subtle points in their work which I say that I cannot really uh, give, discuss in half an hour. So, my apology to my mathematician friends if this talk has been very sketchy, but I meant it for a general audience and I thank you for your presence. Thank you. Thank you, Krishnandu. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes, sir. I would like to ask a question that uh, can the probabilistic techniques of Furstenberg be used to solve the much more uh, stronger version of Zimmerdi's theorem, that is the Eddish conjecture? Could, could they be used? Uh, I mean, they have prospect. I, I, I don't know, but maybe it can be used. I mean, unless you use it and you solve the problem, we cannot say which can be used and which cannot be, right? But yes, it's worth trying. I mean, but for that, one needs to understand the original work of uh, Margulis to prove the Zemeradis theorem. And yes, one thing I must say here that uh, if there are uh, final year BSNS students, I mean, they, you can pick just one theorem by one of these amateur years and can write an entire English thesis based on that theorem. That would be a good point. I hope I have answered your questions. Thank you, sir. Also, would you uh, enlighten us on uh, the application of Margulis' work on uh, Maria Mirza Kani's work? No, 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 no. It's not application. I mean, I mean yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what Maria Mirza Kani did, she used uh, uh, this work of, this idea of Margulis, uh, the ideas of Margulis' work in a different setup. So there is this uh, theory of moduli spaces of surfaces. So Mirzakani and Eskin, they gave a version of Wagner's theorem of unipotent flows in that setup. So in that way, they are, the, I mean, the main ideas or, uh, I mean, of course, the work of Eskin and Margulis is huge and it does not follow immediately from the work of uh, Margulis or Wagner, but it has its origin in the work of Margulis, Rognathan, Wagner, Dani, and Eskin. So in that sense, uh, uh, you know, it's the influence of Margulis that is tremendous in mathematics. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Any question from the YouTube link? Uh, no questions, sir, Kaushik. Okay. So, uh, if there is a, uh, any other question, you can always approach Dr. Krishnandu uh, by sending email, and I'm sure he'll be happy to answer that. Absolutely. So, with this, uh, we would like to end uh, the session. And before we finish, I, or on behalf of Aisar Mohali, would like to thank particularly the, the guest speakers, uh, Professor Parikshit Ghosh and Professor Himadri Roy, for their time and for their talk, wonderful talk. And also our thanks to all the speakers, starting from Rajesh, uh, Sharvan, Kinjal, and Krishnendu. And also I'd like to thank uh, Prasad, uh, Professor N.G. Prasad, uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Anand, Dr. Shugumar for helping, for their tremendous help in uh, making uh, this online platform working throughout the process. Uh, so thank you all and thanks to all the participants who have joined through uh, Zoom link, who are watching this session through YouTube link. Thanks to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kush. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Professor Roy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.
So Vijay, I think we can end the session now.